What up, dude? What's going on? Oh, I'm just hanging out, man. Happy Halloween. Yeah, it's uh, it's been busy for me today. I've been working hard. <laughs> that's uh, that's 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 not too bad. I woke up this morning, and uh, so for a little backstory, I do. I've been doing jujitsu for about a year now, and I have right. guys on Saturday mornings, and we do like a little roll. I've got like a little mats and stuff that I set up in my garage, but my ears have been hurting me really, really bad like the past few nights, yeah. and I found out on uh, I guess it's this side. I have like cauliflower ear starting to come in yeah. and it hurts so bad. And I'm going to have to get some uh, ear guards because it's like down here. You can see yeah. it like, swell up, dude. It hurts. It hurts and it's going to be ugly and I'm going to try to stop it. But uh, I rolled a little bit this morning with one of my buddies that came over. And uh, right. here we are doing an interview with uh, the famous Cole Clark. Yeah, I don't know how famous. Uh, you grow your beard out, or you can look like a beep here soon. <laughs> Dude, I'll, I'll tell you what. Man. I'll tell you what. Uh, I've been following you on Instagram for on my personal account for I don't I don't really know how long. Um, you know, there was a time when I being on the East Coast, I like learned about Ultra Four, and I just followed everybody. I followed all the 40, 4,800, 44, and then all the UTV guys that were racing at the time, and you were lumped in there. So I've actually like kept up with you for a long time and and now that the show's kind of gaining a little bit of traction uh it's nice that you know friend of a friend once said hey man uh you need to interview this guy or this guy and then i get some contact info and that's kind of how we got connected yeah. uh dude so excited to have you on again this is one of those moments where like you know uh the famous guy on instagram that's a racer that I, does what i want to do is now in studio with me yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you having me on. It's uh, good to spread my story and uh, maybe I can help somebody else out in the way. Yeah. So let's start there. Tell me about yourself outside the off-road racing world. What do you like to do? What do you not like to do? What do you do as a job? All that kind of fun stuff. Um, in 2017, I started my own business. So I've been a, a, a self-employed since then. Um, I really just race mostly all the time. If I'm not doing that in the wintertime, I live in Colorado, so we have a ton of snow. So I love to go snowmobiling. That's like okay. my, that's probably my first love. I love snowmobiling. That's if, if I could do it all year round, I'm not as good as a snowmobiler as I am a racer. So yeah. <laughs> it, it kind of, kind of goes from there, but they work really well hand in hand. Cause my snowmobile parts and UTV guys, I mean, most of them make both. They started out snowmobile people mm -hmm. and then they transferred into the UTV so I can get, uh, get parts there and I can help, uh, I can get help from, every which way and it, it kind of helps my sponsors mm -hmm. because if they're already snowmobile people whenever i'm not racing i can go out and ride my sled and it kind of helps it come full circle it's double so, duty absolutely and you know i'm not really an athlete for them as i am mm -hmm. with the, the utv stuff but i can be an ambassador and i can help them out and uh, give them a little more content every once in a while yeah. if i can if i can get a good spill and <laughs> get it on video <laughs> <laughs> yeah dude so that's that's something funny is when you when you start getting sponsors and you start having people, you know, you really want to give them good value back. So when you start making these videos and stuff uh, like I had my neighbor one time, I started the video and he was coming to talk to me and he's watching me do it. And he just stood there the entire time. I was like talking about my tires or something. Yeah. And I'm just like, I can see him out of the corner of my eye. And I'm like, this is horrible. This is so yeah. weird. And uh, I, I, it's a lot harder than people make it seem. You guys, like your last one with the the cryo heat, a uh, little ring snap ring in the transmission, dude. I was like, this guy's got it nailed. Yeah, I try to do as much as I can. Um, I'm not even sponsored by cryo heat, but it's mm -hmm. kind of like a dressing for the job that you want, you know? Because yeah. I, I'd like to, I'd like to help come. I want to be with the best companies possible. And mm -hmm. uh, if you don't have the best, if you don't believe in the parts that are on your car then you shouldn't be running them. You know, yeah. I, I always say that the most expensive parts are the, are the free ones. Cause uh, if you, <laughs> because you have to do so much work for them and you have yeah. to, and, and sometimes if you, if someone sends you a free part, uh, like Lauren Healy, he was telling me a story. Um, he's been a pretty good mentor to me. He helped me out um, through the racing. He was telling me a story that he, the first time he won King of the Hammers, he, uh, all these companies came to him and said, Hey, run my stuff, run my stuff. And they got all these free parts, you know, never tested parts. And mm -hmm. he put them on his race car and he kept breaking over and over and over because he wasn't he wasn't representing a company he truly believed in. He mm -hmm. was representing companies that just gave him free stuff. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, sometimes that's the most expensive thing. How much does it cost to go to a race? How much does it how much does it mean to you to go out on the trail with your family and on a on a 
part that's untested that you don't yeah. believe in. You know, that can that can be that can be serious sometimes. Yeah, that's that's part of the like that's part of the whole sponsorship model. And you know, I think when you're first getting started, you know, any sponsorship is just like wow, incredible, yeah. and you'll take it. And like that is a, a stepping stone. Um, but that's one of the things, and I'm sure you're the same way. You know, in in sponsorship for the podcast, I require them to send me things up front. And I'll say, hey, like, if you want me to do this, you know, we can talk about sponsorship, but I need to have personal experience if I'm going to promote it. Because if I go out, you know, and someone sends me, uh, you know, for example, like an axle or something, and you go snap three axles while you're out and you're, you mean, you're in bad shape, I'll come back and be like, flute, dude, I can't put my name on that because that's horrible representation and I lose my credibility. Yeah, it makes it difficult because, you know, a lot of these guys need, I mean, everyone needs financial support and everyone needs parts. Yeah. And it's it's hard to say no to that free stuff sometimes because because of what it can it can free up budget for so much so many other things that you might need, you know. You might mm-hmm. think you can skimp out on this little part and buy the big part, but really, you never you never know. Well, it's you're going to find a weak link eventually. And I try to represent like all my companies that that I, I get on board with me. I, I believe that they're the best I could possibly get. Yeah. Uh, like my shirt ZRP. I I'm pretty new with ZRP. Uh, they're, they've been helping me out. Travis and I have been friends for a long time, but uh, they make the best quality stuff, man. I don't know if you've ever seen any of their parts or yeah. like their hubs and, and things like that. It's just next level. It's not even comparable. When you look yeah. at it, it looks like a piece of art in your hand. So yeah. it's, uh, I just, I, I like to represent companies that, that, build quality, quality products. And in turn, it gets you to the finish line. If you put Mm -hmm. something cheap on your car, it's going to break. It's, it's, it's going to happen. And hopefully I know it's our jobs as racers and, uh, and if you're, if you're being sponsored to help R and D the company, but hopefully Mm -hmm. you get a company that wants to move forward. Cause I've had companies in the past that you break their part and their answer is to just send you another one. Like that doesn't fix anything for you and me. So it's, it's a, it's kind of a, it's hard to keep everybody happy in the long run. <laughs> it is. And I'll tell you this too. Like I have fallen victim to uh, like buying a brand because, you know, like a hype brand. Yeah. I mean, like for example, I've got a set of tie rods in my car or they're not even, they're, they're in the box that I bought them in because I never put them on because as soon as I bought them, all of a sudden all this stuff started, you know, floating to my attention of like the tie rod end doesn't get warrantied. It goes, you know, you've got slop in the yeah. tie rod end and one ride. And I'm just like, dude, I just wasted 200 bucks and I feel like an idiot. And, yeah. Uh, it, 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 it really has an impact. Like if I looked at one particular racer and he said, Hey, this is the part to run. Trust me. I beat on it all the time. It's great. And I bought it. And then I have that experience or I have, you know, the guys I ride with are having that experience. Like I'm not even putting them on my car because I don't want to deal with it. The stock yeah. is a better option in my opinion. Well, then his then his word doesn't mean as much if, if exactly. he's putting on a product or he's saying that a product is good and it's really not, you know. Yeah. So yeah. I've, there's there's several people. I'm not going to call anybody out, but I know people who run stickers that don't even run the part just because. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's it, it's just part of it. And yeah. it, it's, it's kind of a game. And sometimes I don't like that. Sometimes I'd rather just pay for something just because I know it's quality. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, like I said. The most expensive parts are the free ones. Yeah. Well, anyways, we'll, we'll we we digress from that. Yep. Uh, so you get into racing. How does that happen for you? Because you know, it seems like I did. You know, I do my little I do my little searching through social media and stuff. It seems like you just go from zero to a hundred, and then you're here. It's it's kind of a long story, but we got, Come on, some we got time. time. So um, I raced motocross from when I was seven seven years old, pretty competitively. Um, I'm from Cortez, Colorado, where Eli Tomac's from. So we, I raced with Eli pretty much for, for a good part of my younger years. He kind of took off because he was just so good, but there's crazy how many good motocross riders come from this area and competitive people that just didn't have the financing to keep up with what his program had. Mm -hmm. And, um, like there's kids here that were just a little bit of, above me that were beating him at tracks around here so their family didn't quite have the the means to keep pushing forward you know go to loretta lynn's and spend seven thousand dollars on a little kid to go racing you know that's a lot of money especially you don't know how he's gonna do he's gonna hold up to the pressure Mm -hmm. and you know that's a lot on a little kid anyways we raced for a long time and uh we were pretty competitive but i was never really great i was Mm -hmm. never like a next level kid 
So I uh, found girls when I was about 16 and that kind of, <laughs> that, that kind of tapered off my motocross career. And I was tired yeah. of getting hurt. I've, I've broke a lot of bones, legs, feet, um, collarbones, pretty much everything mm -hmm. there. I, uh, I wasn't really doing anything racing wise. I just was into cars and, and fixing stuff up. I had a Mustang and um, started getting into diesel trucks, really yeah. loved diesel trucks. And I think I was, I think I was 19 when I bought my first razor. It was a four seater and I drove that thing. It was a, a XP 1000 right when the 1000 came out. And it was yeah. the toughest thing I ever saw in my life. I was like, that is so cool. I didn't, I didn't even have a truck to pull it at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I'm going to finance that thing. It's going to be mine. I love it. And uh, eventually I'd got the truck and everything to pull with. But um, yeah. anyways, I drove that thing like I stole it. I broke every part on it and it just kept falling apart and falling apart. And I was like, I got to figure something out. So I started beefing it up a little bit. And uh, one day I was driving it around and me and my buddy were, we were cruising up the hill. We heard this loud bang and I got out of the car and it started smoldering. The whole car went up and like it had to have been like. Two two minutes, it just went up like a Christmas tree. Oh my gosh! It was insane. I'd never seen anything like it. And uh, luckily, I mean, we were in some thick brush. And I'm really mm -hmm. happy that that thick brush didn't get caught on fire yeah. and uh, keep going. So, anyways, I got this. I got my four seater. Had a loan on it, whatever. Luckily, I had insurance on it. Um, so I wanted another another car, but I wanted a two seat this time. So I went and bought the 2017 that Razor came out with the 168 horsepower, the, the big boy uh, yeah. turbo Razor. And I, I, I went and purchased that, that unit. I had it for three days and was taking it down the hill uh, from a trail that I was with my buddies. Mm -hmm. And a guy came around the corner of a, uh, we we're going down these switchbacks. Yeah. And a guy in an F-150 cut the corner on the switchback just so he could take the corner shorter. And mm -hmm. I was around the other side. So I locked him up pitched my car sideways and he nailed me on the side of that razor, that brand new three day old razor. And I didn't have insurance on it cause it was three days old. I, I didn't even think about it. I should have, but, um, totaled the razor, like mm -hmm. all the links wrecked, the radius rods wrecked front a arms. It's all stock, but, yeah. um, destroyed everything. Uh, I took it, took it back to my house and just started cutting it up. I was like, trying to figure out how much it was going to cost. I think in stock parts, it was going to be like, this could be like $10,000 in stock parts. Ooh. Tires were flattened. Wheels were busted. I was lucky the passenger and me were, were fine. Yeah. I was going to ask her. Did you, you just walked away. Okay. Yeah. We rolled it. We rolled it over and actually drove it out of there. I mean, it was, wonk, it was wonky, but we drove it out of there. <laughs> yeah. So this kind of brings me into the racing. So, uh, I have this puddle of parts in my uh, in my garage, just sitting there. It's a brand new razor. I think li literally had like I think I had like forty miles on it. And mm. my buddy Chase, you interviewed Cade Rod. Chase, yeah. is, Chase is Cade's brother. Okay. So Chase rode with me uh, in the one thousand. He and he raced before, and he's like, "Man, you got a you got an eye for lines." Mm -hmm. And I was like what do you mean? And he's like, you're, you're just, you, you know how to move, you know how to put the car where it needs to be. And he's like, you should come race. I never paid any attention to it. Cause I had a four seat. Yeah. So I was like, uh, I can't race with this thing. I, mm -hmm. I had looked into it, but it never really crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. And this, this happened in, I want to say this, this wreck happened in October ish. Mm -hmm. So, I went Jimmy's four by four, went down there to see Chase, see what uh what I could do to get this thing race ready. And Randy Rod is there. That's Cade Cade and Chase's dad. Yeah. I was like, hey, I was thinking about racing this thing at King of the Hammers. I know you guys do that race. I, I hear it's pretty cool. And and I'm like, I think I could probably do pretty well there. And he's like, You'll be lucky to just finish that race. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, No, just being arrogant. Yeah. So I uh I got on the old internet and sent out a bunch of bunch of stuff to people uh from my motocross career just sending out yeah. all my accolades from from that kind of stuff and awards that i won there and said hey i want to i'm gonna try this utv thing and a couple people jumped on like zebros a company i'm with still today yeah uh, and we've developed uh i mean 
from the parts that they were making when we first started racing with them to the parts that I have now are night and day, like full chromoly beast parts. When yeah. we started, we were snapping stuff left and right. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about sponsors that want to grow. Yeah. But um, anyways, Rand Randy helped me with some parts. You know, I literally went to K KOH with uh, all my credit cards maxed out. I literally had no money. I had $15 when I got to KOH. Oh my God. All my credit cards were maxed out completely. I had no money. Lucky my dad showed up because my dad said he was going to, he said, think about, because my dad lives in California. Uh -huh. My dad shows up and we didn't have a GPS. And that was like what I was just extremely worried about. We were just going to run it off our little uh, iPhone. Yeah. Run the race off of it. And I equivalate this, like if you're going to be a football player and your first, and your first game is a Super Bowl going to KOH. <laughs> yeah, that's it's probably like, a good way to put that. It's, uh, I have so, it was in so deep. I had no idea what I was doing. We literally, I have no, like when I look back at it, I just, it blows my mind to think that I thought I could conquer that. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm interested that you like, tell me about the race. Let's get there first. Cause that's, that's the most interesting part of this is like, how did, how did it go for you? Well, I, we built the car and uh, on a shoestring budget. Uh, yeah. we, we get there, we show up, uh, we get everything in. We're entered. Like I said, I got like 15 bucks to my name. Kenny, I have a, enough food for me and my co-driver. And the car has never been tested. Literally, we've just dr drove it on the trailer after we built it. Took it to King of the Ham or took it to Johnson Valley, and uh, putting wiring in still for the radios and everything. And, uh, we get to qualifying. Like I didn't even put the J or I didn't even put the cotter pins in the jam nuts for the axles or in the castle nuts for the axles. So <laughs> everything's just spinning loose. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I started the qualifying course in two wheel drive in high gear and high gear, two wheel drive. And, uh, like I pull up to the obstacle, put it in four, put it in low. <laughs> like, it's just total rookie move. Anyway, <laughs> That was the first time I drove the car. I hadn't even driven it on the trails or anything. Qualifying was the first time. I I never I didn't pre-run the qualifying. I didn't pre-run anything. So we uh we go out, do the qualifying. I think qualified like 68th, which was pretty admirable for honestly what we had done. Yeah. And uh, so I take it out. How many vehicles typically? Do what? Uh, how many vehicles typically are in the UTV class? I mean, there were 118 that year. Okay. Wow. That was my first year. Hey, and the middle of the pack, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, for for like what we had, I I'm pretty impressed. When I look back, it's, it kind yeah. of blows my mind. Um, and and it's like from just 2018 racing that race to the competition level that's there now. I wish I would know what I know now back then because it's so much harder to win that race now. Mm -hmm. Like the amount of money and support that's put into that to to the racers there, mm -hmm. and how much knowledge these guys have, and how how competitive everyone is if you don't have a perfect day you're not winning that race yeah so um after qualifying we take the car out we take it uh i didn't even know the course so i just went and found some rock trails um some pretty mm -hmm. nasty ones like upper big johnson and stuff i took my dad out my dad's a, a pretty much a city boy from california he mm -hmm. never really done anything like this i'm a first generation racer so this is like this is 100 new to us we know nothing i've never yeah. rock crawled I mean, I've gone to Moab, Utah before and in my mm -hmm. fourth seat and stuff. So we're going through this stuff and I'm like, I think that's the trail. And there's just these boulders just, yeah. <laughs> and it was amazing what that thing could do in the basic form that it was in. And so we, we finally uh, get back to the trailer. Thank God that we didn't break down because we would have need a helicopter to get out there. We didn't, <laughs> we didn't have a, we didn't have any, I mean, we had Jimmy's four by four, but we were the low man on the totem pole. You know, like yeah. these guys, these guys looked at us like this guy thinks he's going to come racing. He doesn't, he's not, a, he doesn't, he's not in for the long haul. He just, mm -hmm. he's going to get, he's going to get beat down and then we're going to send him packing. That's basically what it was, you know? Yeah. They helped me pit a little bit, but race day comes, we go off the line and we're just, you know, I, I'm a motocross from a motocross background and it is just get it like flat yeah. out, go as fast as you can. And stock shocks, everything, and that's where I'm at. I'm getting it 100. Not, not even thinking that I got 140 miles ahead of me. Yeah. And I'm passing cars. I think we made it from 68 to 24th in 15 miles. Dude. Yeah, we were hauling, and it was yeah. it was not a maintainable pace. Oh, that's where that's what I'm getting at. 
Mm -hmm. um, I had no idea what I was getting into and people kept telling like I thought, you know, I was I was doing good. We're passing people. We're going to make our way to the front. Well, uh, we get caught by this Yamaha and we're cruising. I think this is mile like I think it's mile 20. Mm -hmm. And there was a spot in the road or in the in the trail where the it was whooped out. And then mm -hmm. there was a, an actual road that had been paved through by a dozer. So it was like a four foot drop. And this, you know, this YXE, you know, it was pretty beefed up. So it handled it. My car hit it and dove right down into the other Ooh. side where it come up yeah. and blew out the front aim arms. Like, oh. them. and I, I was just like, that's it. I spent all this money, spent all this time, had no money. Yeah. And I'm sitting there just like, I can't believe it's over. I can't, I can't believe this is, we're done. Yeah. And to make matters worse, my buddy, you know, he'd never raced before anything. My co-driver. Yeah. And our, our actual, our pumper filter on our, uh, on the pumper blows off, uh, before this. So we're getting, we're getting dust sucked into our helmets. Oh God. It, it was so, it was, it was horrible, but I had the pumper wired to the ignition so we couldn't yeah. turn it off. <laughs> oh God. So I just ripped my hose off or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and, but he sticks his fingers in there. I'm like, what do you think's in there, buddy? It's, there's a fan <laughs> Yeah. chops his finger. So we're not only we wrecked down. Or, or, or we're broke down, but he chops his finger in half. So we basically have to, it cut it bad. So I'm, we're doing emergency uh, services on the side of the trail while all these people are passing us that we just passed. Yeah. And it was just a total rookie move, but I was, I was absolutely hooked from there. It was. Dude, that's, that's one of the ballsiest stories I think I've ever heard. And like the whole term, like ignorance is bliss. Yeah. Dude, that's amazing. <laughs> no, that's exactly how I put it. It is. It was, it was the start of, everything that i have now and i have to say like racing saved my life because i was i was drinking i was partying all the time you know i never was i never was solid on anything i would just mm -hmm. jump from thing to thing and um when i found when i found this it literally i've i've quit drinking i've quit i've been sober for quite a uh, quite a long time now and I'm, I'm pretty happy about it and it's like i said it's it's really saved my life it's Dude, been the amazing, best man. thing ever that's awesome. So you go, you have your first King of Hammers experience. Uh, and, and I mean, when did you make the jump? Because you're, you're obviously at a different level now. You know, you're very much a professional race team, a professional racer. When did it go from, okay, I have this rig that's like partially put together to, you know, I'm now on, well, let's talk about this, from there to right before you changed over to the Turbo S. How did, how did that jump happen for you? So, so that car was probably the, the original car that I started with had a lot of evolution through it. So I, I eventually took it off the Zebro's front suspension because they didn't make a product at the time that was durable enough for what we do in Ultra 4. The A-arms were too small. Directly after that race, actually, after KOH, I said, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. And I'm going to figure it out. doesn't matter. If I don't have the money, I'll find the money somewhere. I'll figure it out. So I... Uh, we went to the Ultra Four Stampede race, which is in California, the first regional or mm -hmm. I guess West Coast race. And we actually did really well. We qualified uh, fifth out of 35 cars. Um, I won my heat race. I then, I don't know if you know who Bo Judge is. That's Phil Blurton's co driver. Yeah. He was racing Phil Blurton's car at that race, a car that was nine times the car that I had. Like, so yeah. much better like this yeah. they've got stuff figured out oh, on yeah. those on those can amps and uh you know we lost out of, out of the gate we we started uh neck and neck with him mm -hmm. and he he cut me off and i thought you know usually the inside guy will flip the other guy over my car mm -hmm. the real, literally right at the beginning of the race goes up on two wheels and i'm like driving it through the first corner so i oh. lose five places immediately yeah but uh i i pass all those guys um, up to second and I put, I caught, uh, I think he was 14 seconds ahead of me and I pulled him down to seven seconds at the end of the race. So I got second, my second race and I was just super ecstatic. And I was like, we got something here, you know, yeah. we, 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 we got to keep going. Why would I stop now? And then, um, you know, I, I, I kept getting podiums. I kept, uh, kept doing well, but I was really hungry for that first win mm -hmm. and I couldn't get the clutching figured out. I kept blowing belts. I just literally had no idea what to do. I was getting clutch kit after clutch kit, like 
there's no such thing as a clutch kit. When I when I tell people this, they their minds get blown. I'm sorry mm -hmm. to tell you this, but a, a clutching is just for elevation. It's for horsepower and for weight that you put on your vehicle. Mm -hmm. There's not a clutch kit that you can just buy and it's going to be perfect. It's going to be spot yeah. on for your specific needs. Like, mm -hmm. let's say you have a huge co-driver that weighs a lot more than my co-driver, or I don't even use a co-driver most of the time. Mm -hmm. You have 300 pounds or 200 pounds on the side of you that's not there with me it's going to be a completely different setup because our motors are so small it's a power to weight ratio mm -hmm. and um i couldn't get this figured out so i went to mark queen and uh at mark queen racing and he he tunes mitch guthrie or he used to tune mitch guthrie's motors and stuff like mm -hmm. that and i was like i need to get this thing dialed in so that i can actually finish a race without blowing a belt mm -hmm. and uh it turns out he Dude, he put it together perfect. Uh, I, he actually he actually put uh, parts from um, Adam at Airdam Clutching. If uh, mm -hmm. you guys ever have a problem with clutching, Adam is the best. I I don't know anyone in this world who knows more about CVT clutching than that guy. Okay. You can you can call him and tell him like uh, any. I'm not even sponsored by these guys. Adam yeah. is just the best. You can call him and tell him what it's doing, and he will literally he will think of something up in five seconds and will fix your issue. It is insane. That's he, awesome. He's a genius. Yeah. And he's got a, he's got a Southern accent and you wouldn't think <laughs> it. And it's like, dude, the guy is amazing. So we got this car figured out. Yeah. We went to Mexico and, uh, went and raced the King of the Baja mm -hmm. and the car was amazing. You know, I was handling, I, uh, we qualified fifth or something like that past everyone. Lauren Healy qualified first past him. So we passed everyone in the first lap. Then the front hub goes out. <laughs> so we change the front hub, pass everyone again. Oh my gosh. And then we run out of gas three miles from the finish line. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh, dude. The heartbreak stories keep coming. Yep. And it's just like, oh man, that was tough. So we weren't going to go to Oklahoma that year. Mm -hmm. And we decided to, cause I was like, man, we got it. We got, we're so close. We're so close to this thing. And, uh, Ended up going to Oklahoma, have a perfect race, not a single issue, and we take home our, our first win. I actually beat Nathan Wolf there last year, so he got me this year. But <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, and that's that right there is where things turned around. That car was amazing. You know, we uh we went to we had some cooling issues with it, and I don't want to go into details about the company that kind of screwed me over there, but, uh, I don't have to it ain't worth it. It, it was, uh, I, I should from the way they treated me, <laughs> but I'm not going to say if you want to, you can, I'm, I'm saying I'm indifferent. I'm not going to prod on it. Cause I, I agree, man. Positivity normally helps you out. In the world. Yeah. I'm not, I don't need to say anything, but, uh, they're one of the big cooling company companies. So you'll probably know who they are. <laughs> sure. Um, anyways, we went to nationals. We, I mean, we won that race by, I think it was a minute and 30 seconds on a short course. We lapped everyone up to third place. That's awesome. And then, uh, then the zebros came to me and said, Hey, we want to build a car. Uh, we've, we've, we want to build two cars. We want to build a twin turbo S sister cars and we want you to drive the other one. So this car I have now, I don't own. It's just, mm -hmm. uh, I just drive it for them. Mm -hmm. And I was like, my car's whooped. Like if you look down the chassis of my, of my car it looks like a gun barrel <laughs> it was just so brutal and i didn't have the suspension set up so i was just hogging that thing through everything yeah. just hitting the frame and yeah buddy it, yeah you just just sending it and uh, that's what it takes to win now dude it's yeah. so competitive it's yeah. so competitive like how fast guys are going and you just have to be on the edge of losing it the whole entire race for three hours you got to be on the edge and not lose it you got to so, be perfect. Let me let me pause. You got two things to say here. Uh, one of those is factory support, and then I'm telling you this, and you'll help me remember. And the second is all of my Polaris to Can Am converts tell me that when they drove uh, their Turbo S, their their turbos, they were always on that razor thin line of out of control control. So when you say that, because again, you know, you just brought that up on your own that exact yeah. phrase. Uh, you know, they say when they switch to the Can Am, it, it, the that threshold of control and not in control is not in the sphere of things. Now, I've personally have never driven an X3 like to, uh, to rails type stuff, but I do know what you're saying that when you're really like 
for as like Miles Hasquist says, when you're really hauling the mail, yeah. uh, you are right on that line. You know, you know, being able to steer, being able to stay on all four wheels, things like that. Uh, I know that feeling. And I think to me, that's just I always thought UTVs were that way. Now, I've ridden in an X3 and it's I mean, it's it is too much power for the frame is the way I look at it. It, is, it feels unsafe, you know, uh, yeah. but I, it's interesting that you say that. And uh, I'll, I'll digress here for a second. Do you, have you ever driven an X3? I knew you were going to ask me this question. <laughs> <laughs> it has to come up. The debate uh, is too strong right now. Um, you know, I those guys that say that like they're not. I, I that say that you ha- that the razor's out of control. Like they're not. I mean, they're winning races, but you know, I, I beat. My, I usually race against those guys, and we we usually win. So yeah. they can't really. Um, I think the Can Am has more of a sports car feel. Mm-hmm. So it's got you lay back in it, and it's got a lower center of gravity, and you don't sit as high. So it gives you more confidence. It's not that the car is doing anything different. I think it's just, it gives you more confidence because you're sitting lower and you're like in the razor, you kind of sit up and your head's moving over further rather than the Can-Am you're super laid back and you're, yeah. uh, you just seem closer to the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, I've driven both of them. I think both of them are great machines, but for what I do, I don't think there's that big of a gap in uh, performance from the, the razor to the, can am when you look at durability and you look at just how tough the razor is compared to the can am yeah i don't see i don't even see a a resemblance or like any comparison because the front diff's way better the drivetrain's better um like i said once you get the belt the i don't have any issues with belt i've never blown i haven't built blown a belt in two years yeah so people say that the belts can't be tuned in and that the um that the temperatures can't be controlled like our last race in oklahoma we had I think the highest belt temp I had was 150 degrees. That's what yeah. Tony Trail was telling me. I mean, he's he's yeah. in the same 160 range, and I was like, so when I in my machine, I've slipped a belt, but yeah. I've never blown a belt. And granted, you know, I'm not like you know standing in my throttle 90 percent of the time I drive it by any means. But there's guys out there who trail ride all the time and blowing belts left and right. I'm like knock on wood here. I've never blown a belt. Period. So nice. I, I really think you know a lot of Again, I think you're right about the 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 mannerisms of how you sit and where you sit in the car. They make it make it feel a certain way, but how you treat the car and when you know it's it's like the finer details of racing. You know, can you go out there and blow a belt if you're racing and you race it and and, and you treat it poorly at the right time? Absolutely, yep. it'll just happen. But there's a little. I don't want to say like th- there's not a there's the the perfect touch that you can have and the perfect feel back from the machine that you can get where you can realize when is, when's too far and when's not far enough, you know? Yeah. Uh, and you got you know, to have the knowledge to know where too far is. You exactly. Know, a, lot, a lot of people will buy these machines and they just think that they're impenetrable and they can just be hammered on. Like yeah. they can't, they can be, and they can be for a while, but when they start breaking and they start falling apart, you got to maintenance those parts. Mm-hmm. Like, the, the stuff in the clutches, the rollers, things like that. Um, people will destroy, they'll keep it in high gear all the time yeah. and not have the gearing right in the transmission and just destroy the clutch. They'll wear the belt so hard that this the side of the sheaves of the clutch will eventually blow apart. I'm sure you've seen those clutches oh, yeah. that blow apart. It's oh, because yeah. they're riding the belt so hard on the clutch that mm-hmm. it's, it's thinning the aluminum and eventually they're just going to blow it out because they don't know what they're doing. Yeah, I agree. And, and I, I would, I would agree with you too, that there's, there's a little bit more of a spotlight on that in the razor because the razor is obviously the most popular, yeah. you know, uh, hobbyist machine for sure. Like, I think it's five to one or something. Yeah, like that. It's, it's no, there's no, not yeah. even close. And to go back, my other piece to that, that you were, t- we were talking about, you know, um, you know, as as you race in a in a razor machine, you know the old machine you had it was kind of you know twisted, bent a little bit. You know, it's like got its paid its dues basically. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> those razor machines are are out there and all that, and there's there's plenty of sponsors and things like that. But uh, you know, we'll we'll call a call a duck a duck. The K and M guys are getting new machines every year. There's Dude. some there's Dude. something to that. You know, there's something to the fact of you know, okay. If, uh, you know, the number one guy in the, in the Ultra 4 National Series knows he's going to get a new frame, a new everything yeah. next year, 
why would you not abuse it? Why would you not do this? And on top of that, you're not dealing with the issues and the symptoms of last season. You know, you yeah. don't have to. And, and, and here's my knock on Can Am. You know, when they got the car or any of the guys, they tear it completely down to the yeah. frame, have to weld in, you know, 10 to 12 chassis on the on the yeah. braces on the chassis. Like you essentially have to already improve on the foundational level of the car. Now, all that to be said, can ams doing awesome. They they have an excellent track record. But my 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 question for you as we as we break into, you know, the Turbo S machine that you guys are racing now, there's only a handful of Polaris guys who are at the top and who are consistently at the top. And you're one of those guys who, you know, when when people want to say, well Can Am is taking over the race scene, Can Am's winning all the races, you're one of the guys that you, you know you have to point to and go, that's not exactly true. And I, I want to know, you know, first off, I mean, how, well, the question is, how are you doing that? And, and why are you separated from the other guys who, you know, have the same machines, have the same resources, all these things, but they're not podium. You know, they're not on the podium every race like you are. I think it's, I, I have to give it to Can-Am because I love what Can-Am's doing. They're investing so much into racing. Like they won yeah. the hammers this year because they loaded the deck. They mm -hmm. put the best drivers they have. They took the best guys that they have, which are amazing drivers. And uh, they, they, they said, Hey, we're going to give you basically a blank check. Go win me that race. Exactly. And Polaris doesn't seem to have that. You know, they don't have that fire to, to race anymore. Like it seems like they used to. Mm -hmm. Because they used to just, I mean, like I said, they're five to one. So if mm -hmm. you go out there, like I'm not affiliated with Polaris at all. I'm not a factory that guy. Was, that was one of my questions coming up. So I don't um, know. Are, are, you, are you a tier driver at all? No, I don't get anything. Cool. Perfect. We can, have a, we can have an unfiltered conversation because both of us have to pay for everything. It <laughs> kind of drives me insane. Like how well, there's, there's people below me that are, that are getting factory support and I have a solid following. I have solid, like I'm doing everything I can to be part of that job. And, good. That's and it's like, how, at what point do I have to go to a different company? Like, I mean, it, I can only do this for so long until it's like, Hey, we need to make uh, a means to an end with the cars. Cause I can't buy a, a machine every year, every two years. Cause they're, they're probably for, for racing. They're really only good for about two years on a, yeah. on a chassis. If you have a custom built chassis where you redo the lowers and everything, mm -hmm. um, you could get more out of it and keep changing it and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But really on a stock chassis for what we do is, is the perfect length. I think, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I really, you don't have to do much. So it's like, at what point do I have to say, Hey, these other people want to talk to me these other people want, want to do business with me, but I'm holding true to razor because you know, that's what I do. I ride Polaris snowmobiles. I ride, mm -hmm. I drive Polaris rides. I have my, uh, we had a Polaris Ranger growing up that we just would destroy that thing. So yeah. it was like Polaris, you know, it runs in my family. We, I, I love that. Or it's not necessarily my family, but mm -hmm. it's just me. Polaris yeah. seems to be me. I like the brand. I like everything yeah. about it. And when they kind of turn their back on me and, and not helping me out the way I think they should be. And, and I, I don't mean that like saying, Oh, you, you need to, that, 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 that Polaris needs to help or that a company needs to help you. Like, mm -hmm. what can you do for them first? What can you, what can you show them that you, that you are doing what you're supposed to be doing and, and to, and to provide real ROI, like a return on your vet on their investment. Because if, if they're just going to give you parts or they're going to give you that and you don't do anything for them, then mm -hmm. it makes no sense. But it's, I don't even say sponsorship. I, I like the term partnership okay. because it's not a sponsor. A sponsor is uh someone that sponsors you for to run miles for cancer or something. They're just going to give you the money because you're, yeah. because you're doing it for a good cause. You know, that's a sponsorship. Yeah. I it's think great. about all the time. So like, uh, I'm a big fan of the UFC. So yep. Modelo, right? yeah, dude. So, okay. Yep. Anytime you watch a fight, Modelo Especial yep. is like everywhere. It's in the cage. It's the commercial. Yep. That is a sponsorship because I mean, they're trying to get some, you know, ROI by advertisement, but yep. All in all, they're basically just handing the UFC money and saying, you know, we're going to we're going to get something back from this, but it's not really any work on the UFC's end. It's just a yeah. static thing that's in the cage. But you got to look at what UFC's built. They've built a huge Agreed. following, a huge Agreed. platform where millions of people are watching that. So it they they they're in such a highlighted that they're like a 
like an F1 driver mm -hmm. of what I would consider racing. Yeah. Because they build this huge following. All they have to do is post a picture mm -hmm. and millions of people are going to see it. Like I have to somewhat have to prove a part. I have to show, I have to do it by results. And by my results, I gain a following. And by the following helps me get sponsors because or partners. Because mm -hmm. what happens when you're not winning? If you don't have followers, then you don't have anything to give these companies. You know, if you mm -hmm. if you solely base your um your value on your your results, eventually there will be a day where I won't be competitive anymore. I'll be slower than the guys coming up. And mm -hmm. I have to I have to make sure that I that I use my results to build my following to make sure that I'm relevant later on in life. Yeah. And uh, and hopefully I can keep doing this for a long time. I'm not uh, racing is, is cool because you know old guys get to race and they're pretty yeah. fast. I mean look at Jamie McCoy. He's old guy <laughs> <laughs> oh, boom. <laughs> yeah. Jamie, Jamie's gonna be on the show next week, so I'll tell him. <laughs> he's he's fast, man. He's uh he passed me a couple times in Oklahoma, but we just I, I knew that he was gonna he was gonna push hard for a win. Mm -hmm. And I knew if I just kept behind him, I would be I would be safe spot. Yeah because he, he just he drives that thing like crazy. Like I, I don't I don't like to drive that style. I don't drive that that uh like you'll never see a cool picture of me where my wheels are all flied out and uh yeah, I like to be controlled. I like my car to be, you know, really handled perfect. And I don't, I drive fast where I can and drive a little slower where I don't, because I want to make sure I've had a tendency in the past to not finish races. So mm -hmm. when I want to finish races, but back to what you were saying about the Can-Am and, and Polaris and factory sport, I think that um, Can-Am's doing a great thing with their drivers and they're really helping them out because they want to be the best. They want to show that they're the best through racing, mm -hmm. which I think is a, which is a, a good thing. And I think Razor's uh, marketing plan just isn't quite, I, I don't know. I, I can't really say that I, I know exactly, but I can't say that Polaris, um, their marketing plan is to just go through racing anymore. Like if you listen to some other people talk like Evan Shindell, he was their marketing manager. I don't know if he is still, I think he is, but um, he says the, the worst performing content that they, that they have is racing. Mm -hmm. They have a ton of it. They've got so much of it. They don't need any more of it. And, um, that kind of shows me that the, the top guys don't really care that much about racing. If the mm -hmm. CEO doesn't want to win the UTV world championships and, or, or they don't want to win the King of the hammers, they don't care about it. Then mm -hmm. it's not going to be a priority and can, and can am or other companies are going to continue to build success and grow their companies by gaining really good drivers. And, and that's where the shift I see is it's not the cars because the cars are competitive. Yeah. The shift is that is that they're willing to invest more into their race program, they're willing to give more to the racers and give them give back more. They're mm -hmm. actually almost willing to lose. You know, they 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 don't necessarily need to gain a dollar sign back on on the racing. They just want to make sure that it's proven. Yeah. And Polaris is kind of like, oh, we are proven. We're gonna keep selling. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need to invest this much in racing. But the the biggest thing that I see, and it's wasted money to me on Polaris' side, and a lot of companies do this. They hold on to old drivers just because they were they used to be fast, mm -hmm. and they used to be they used to be good. Um, it's like having a tool in your toolbox that used to be your favorite tool, but now it's a broken tool, and mm -hmm. you're just holding on to it because it's your favorite tool, or it used to be your favorite tool. Yeah. What do you do? You can that thing, and you bring in a tool that actually works. Yeah. It's actually going to continue to bring you results. It's going to, it's going to do exactly what you need it to do. Yeah. So for me, like if you, I don't know if you ever saw that F1 uh, series on Netflix. It's great. You should watch it. Go back and look at it. I don't remember. You'll love it. It's amazing. Okay. It's, it, it shows you what a real race team looks like. Okay. Like what, what, yeah. we're, what we're doing out here is nothing. These guys have $500 million budgets. Like it's when I say 500 million, I mean, 500 million, uh, Mercedes won't even disclose how much they spend on racing. So, which is <laughs> so that's that's a, that's a question I have because, you know, when we sit here and we talk about it, I, I think to myself, well, you know, racing isn't the end all be all. Like, you know, it really is about hey, can you go get uh, like can you get the regular guy if he wants a leisure machine? You know, are you going to sell him a general? You know, like you're kind of getting that 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 lower demographic market too. That's not hardcore off road. Yeah. It's, I just want something that can kind of do everything and I can take it on the weekend if I want. And they're, they're trying to get that market. And I see that a lot in their advertising 
you know, with like the, the razor, live the razor life stuff. Yeah. And think uh, outside. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's the, it's the general approach and it is, it's so funny. Cause I, I was on the, I had an interview with someone else the other day and I was just talking to him and I couldn't, I couldn't name you like three people that were sponsored by razor. And, you know, it's nothing against the people that are sponsored by razor, but you have, in my opinion, some of the guys that do the ultra four on team razor factory team, they also do 4,400 and it doesn't yeah. make sense for me to, for Polaris, you know, I'm, if I'm Polaris, I'm like, why would, okay. I have the superstar, right. But he's That's a superstar true. in the 4,400 class. And he also races UTVs because we, we give him the support. Now, to me, that's great. And, you know, he's, you know, there, there's a couple of those guys and they're typically top 10 or it seems like a more fruitful investment or just an option to explore. You get a guy who just does UTV and he doesn't just win King of Hammers or he doesn't just race UTVs at King of Hammers. He wins the national series, you know, or she, he or she, yeah. so, okay. you know, there's, there's this King of Hammers is like, you know, the, the one really under the spotlight. And I feel like the national series doesn't get as much, you know, notice or no notoriety, yeah. but it does make sense that, you know, you've got, I mean, best in the desert score warps, all that stuff. Those are all just like, I don't even know you guys, you yeah. know? And, and I do think that there needs to be some, if you're going to go for the general market, you've got to expand your factory team. Like yeah. one of the best guys for Can-Am is uh, Dustin Battleaxe Jones. You know, him, him and S3, like he, he is an excellent driver, excellent at racing. But also I see videos of him down in Mexico doing donuts in the middle of a city and then down <laughs> at a mud bog. And I'm like, dude, like I interviewed him earlier this year. And I was like, I would love to sit down and just hang out and have dinner with that guy. Yeah. That, that, that kind of thing, I'm more inclined to buy a machine than I would be like, man, Hunter Miller won King of Hammers by, you know, 15 minutes, you know, yep. that doesn't, that, that I, I feel like I'm in the sweet spot because I really care about racing, but also yep. at the same time I care, you know, I'd rather go hang out with Dustin Jones than anybody else, you know, absolutely. It, it's one of those where, you know, they just miss the East coast, South, North, you know, like all these, there's so much marketability. Dude, if you had like Stone Cold Steve Austin, I don't know if you follow Phil Lickiardi yeah. Yeah, on, yeah. Dude, Stone Cold is running around the Kawasaki out there in Montana or Arizona, wherever he lives. And like, dude, that's awesome. If, yeah. if you went out east here, you know, and just had like a like a, you know some kind of icon or, or something like that, I feel like that's something that Polaris really misses too for their whole general approach. Yeah. Anyways, I I go off on a team. I, I think it's uh, it it goes back to that return on investment because the, they they see what works and they just want. They, they don't want to innovate. It's mm -hmm. not the innovation doesn't seem to be there. Not with the products. I think the products are innovative. Uh, it's just like the pro XP. People say that was a fail, but the pro XP is an amazing machine. If you drive it. Yeah. It's, it's the best driving machine I've ever been in. Yeah. And there was an, there's another point I wanted to bring up to you that, that you said they don't give enough attention to ultra four and stuff. Mm -hmm. So UTV world championship this year, we had a, a freak accident. We had a, a transmission failure. Mm -hmm. uh, just, Completely not the car's fault, not my fault, not anything's fault. It's just parts fail. Sometimes you push them under that kind of pressure, they fail. And, uh, but we qualified third overall at that rate at, at UTV world championship. Mm -hmm. And I know there's some of the best guys weren't there like Guthrie, Blurton, Dustin Jones, for example, like, um, but they had, did have some heavy hitters like Brandon Sims and things like that. Yeah. Um, so we qualified third overall. To put this in perspective for you, at the last Ultra Four race, we qualified seventh. So there was six guys faster than me just at the Ultra Four race versus at the UTV World Championship, where these guys are the fastest in the world. Like you go out to this Ultra Four race, these guys are hauling hauling the mail. They're they're yeah. getting it. Yeah. Like how can you how can you sit there and say that the, those guys are the pinnacle of racing? Whenever I go when I go out there, I do better out there against those desert guys than I do when I come to my actual racing organization and they're, these guys are getting it. So it's um, weird to me that, that they would, they would see more value in the desert side because ultra four does so many different terrains. Like we'll go mm -hmm. from the desert, we'll go to short course, we'll go to the rocks, then we'll go out East and we'll go rip up the Hills with you guys. Yeah. And it's like, how is that not, the best way to show off your machine that it's it's exactly what a utv is 
or some people call it ATV. It's an all-terrain vehicle. It will go anywhere. It doesn't matter if you live on the East Coast. It doesn't matter if you live on the West Coast. It yeah. will go and dominate the terrain no matter where you go. And if you just show that in a desert scene, mm -hmm. you know, you guys don't, you guys, it doesn't resonate with you going to the desert, going through woods. No. Yeah. And, and look, let me tell you this. So ultra four Southern rock racing series, you know, those, those are the, in my opinion, those are the two things that I pay attention to yeah. really, really well. And what they've done in the past couple of years is they have stepped up their media so much in particular, the, the Kinger King, uh, the hammer, I forget what it is. The hammers production team. I yep. think that's what they're called. Dude, that is the most profitable race setup. That, that, that right there, that, that, live stream that they're doing is going to launch them to, to way beyond any of the other leagues. But I can't watch best in the desert. You know what yeah. happens if I want to watch best in the desert or score or any of that crap, I end up pulling up a, a thing and it's got a map, a line and a bunch of dots on it. Yeah. That cool. blows. Dude, that, that blows. <laughs> the best thing about King of Hammers is that I have hosts there. I get to see people come through the town and the fact, I mean, let's say what it is. I mean, any yeah. of those other races are point A to point B I get it. You can't you can't watch that, but yeah. also you can't monetize watching that. It, it just yeah. I, it, I, and and we'll we'll for those listening, we'll get off our little soapbox of roasting those guys. But uh, it just there's it's, a lot. It's not a roast. It's not a roast. It's just it's saying that Ultra Four is the most innovative group of per, of promotion of racing. It's not yeah. saying that they've just they just done it the same way forever. And mm -hmm. it's I'm not saying that they do it badly or whatever it is. But it's it's got to be better for the drivers. It's got to be better for the team, so we can get more money and support to come help us be be better racers and be faster and be better for the fans. And like you said, it's so much easier to watch an ultra four race because you have the announcers. Mm -hmm. It's like an actual production yeah. versus versus when you go watch another race, you have no idea what's going on. Yes, the track could mess up. It could be you could show some guy way out front who's broke down for twenty miles. You're like exactly you, right. You don't know what's going on, and it's awesome because I can I can be all my family at home can watch me race and and they're going crazy on Facebook. They're going crazy yeah. on Instagram, and it's super cool. Or they or oh, Cole broke down the first five miles. Like yeah. <laughs> we yeah. can turn this off. You know, we're not we're not sitting there on our phone. Like why isn't his tracker ref refreshing or like something like that? Dude, so it's good on me. I'll say it like that, but let me, let me give some kudos to the Southern rock racing series and pro rock, a uh, particular Southern rock. They've integrated like short course into the hill climbs. Um, yeah. Now I, again, I, people have heard me for the past couple of episodes talk about it. I was a little too critical and quick to jump on the gun in the finals. They ran two hills. Typically they run two hills at an event, but they typically run the same hill. Hill number one was like all short course and then like a moderate hill. And then hill number two was short course. And then, like classic Southern giant monster hill. Loved yeah. it. It was perfect. After I had some time to reflect on it, and I even had one of the hosts of their uh, production team on here, I think it's good because, you know, you you don't want lo drivers to load up, drive eight hours, and ride for 20 seconds. That makes a lot of sense to me. But at the same token, I mean, dude, those cars are going to have to change because, oh, yeah. you know, like I saw rock bouncers who, you know, came out in the short course and were super hindered and even broke on, you know, the short course part of Hill One, they yeah. broke. I think that we're in a really cool spot because we're going to see this mishmash of, you know, not only skill, but uh, I think machines will start looking a little different. We had an IFS rock bouncer this year. It was really cool. Yeah. Um, Tim Cameron's. Yeah, dude. Yeah. It, I, I like innovation and and you're exactly right. Like, we're, we're kind of evolving. And I had a discussion with uh, James Cantrell, I think after the podcast was over, but I can't wait for the day where we have the unlimited off-road, you know, uh, unlimited off-road like uh, league or whatever. Yeah. And and it's ultra four is the, you know, AFL in whatever, I forget. I don't do it, it, it for NFL anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the West Coast teams and you have the East Coast teams. And um, Jay, uh, Jay, Oklahoma, Mid-America Off-Road is now going to have visions in the summer. Um, dude, to me, you have your East Coast champion, your West Coast champion. You take top 10 from both. You throw them in, you know, it, you know, maybe you throw them in King of Hammers and something like yeah. that. Or you have some kind of hybrid system where they end up in Jay, Oklahoma, right in the middle of the country. Yeah. And they're doing some kind of combination of everything. And it's like a, a, a faux Super Bowl, you know, because it's kind of apples to oranges in design of machines. But I think that as we integrate more of the short course, we'll kind of get, you know, a little, little bit more uh, dual purpose cars rather than drag cars for the East Coast. I think yep. we'll end up somewhere in the middle. But I love that. 
I think that that idea is cool. I want to see, you know, uh, the, the knockout 2.0 car that started as a bouncer and now races ultra four and 4,400. Uh, like that's, there's, there's just so much on the horizon. It feels so good to be a fan. Oh right yeah. Making point. But I think you're like, what you're talking about is already kind of there. It's like the UTV is the best thing to do all that with. Like what, 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 what do you, you can't go to the desert and and be like a rock bouncer. You can't mm-hmm. do that. But the rock bouncer does the best at what it does. You know, it's mm-hmm. pretty great. I mean, other than like Derek West going out there and he kills it in his, his 4,400 car. Yeah. But, you know, that's the best at what it does. These terrains, it's hard to build a vehicle that just does everything the best. But the UTV does amazing at all of it. If you can take a, a guy who races out in the east and kills hills all day and mm-hmm. his in his... I wouldn't say his full on hill killing machine because they're like single C and, uh, you know, they're full two chassis. They just wouldn't be ergonomic for the desert. But if you took a, just a regular side by side, gave it to him and he went out to the desert, he'd probably do really good. And so there's one guy I'm going to give a shout out to. Uh, his name's Brandon Grapevine. And he, yeah. this, he 2019, tw- I don't know what year it is, 2020, he raced a full body had his whole setup done by G-Force, and, like, it's really a great setup. Yep. Uh, he came out to the Southern Rock Racing Series finals, ran his full body, kicked ass in the short course, and did all the hills. I mean, he, he, he did oh, great. like a tube chassis? It was just no, full? It's nice. a full body. I That's think cool. they, they bobbed the bed because we don't have to yep. worry about storage in our race setups. Yep. But he does the Mid-America, like, you know, endurance coursing. He does Pro Rock Endurance, which is some of our Ultra 4-esque version racing out here. Absolutely. Um, I, I know a few of the guys that race Southern Rock in the hill killing only stuff. They're going back to full bodies this yep. next, coming year because they're seeing the fruit of having, you know, these chassis that are designed by factory engineers are millions of dollars of R&D, you know, oh, absolutely steering, suspension, those things. There's so much to them. And people go build a rock bouncer, everything. Yeah. I mean, people go build a rock bouncer and doesn't drive with crap. Trust me. I've owned yep. one. <laughs> mine, mine drove pretty good. Like yeah. oh, mine was pretty good. Uh, but all that being said, you know, I think I think you're right. I think the UTV is where it all bleeds together. And uh, we have plenty of guys who who do race east and west and everything then together. But uh, I think I'm excited to see Ultra 4 and Southern Rock kind of pair yeah. up together in the, in the middle of the year. I just don't know what a, it's like. Like I said, back to building the machines cor- yeah. like correctly in the right size proportions and travel and things like that. It's it's so hard to make like one machine like you were saying that would just mm-hmm. be so good there and there mm-hmm. rather than having like guys that would have like like if you wanted to go to the East Coast you could uh, you could go drive your East Coast car and then go to the West Coast and drive that car because in the mm-hmm. forty four hundred those cars are getting so wide they're like ninety six inches wide now. Well, think about the teardown in Tennessee when you yeah. know, Lauren Healy's ninety six inch wide car was really having issues. They barely fit through the trails. <laughs> Like yeah. they're hitting trees, mowing trees down to get through. And uh, McCoy laid down a wicked fast time. Uh, I think he, if it wasn't for the Joker line, he would have the fastest time of the day. Really? Yeah, I think it was seventeen minutes and twenty something seconds, and the fastest, oh, wow. the fast, the fastest lap time was sixteen minutes and I think it was fifty something Dang. by ba- Bailey Cole. But they had a Joker line. Forty four hundreds had a Joker line where they could drop down this and cut out a lot of the course. So the Joker line was the fastest. So we don't know if McCoy would have had the fastest lap time, mm-hmm. but that just goes to show that the best 40 or the unlimited vehicle there that day would have been a UTV. Yeah. I, I actually, when I interviewed James, uh, I went back and looked at all of the crossbar lap times and I thought UTV would have it because in qualifying UTVs will always win, you know, yeah. it's, just, it's just by the nature of the course design, they don't put rocks in them, and they're typically yeah. a little bit faster paced. Uh, I think the qualifying time was like three or four seconds faster from the UTV. It was Jamie McCoy, yeah. And then uh, the lap time, fastest lap time for the day, it was forty four hundred by a good couple seconds. They but, have so much power, though. Yeah, I'd like, say you can't. It's thing. not the same when you have you know you're going thirty mile loops. You know, yeah. it's, you go faster, obviously. Well, so. nine hundred horsepower, no matter how you look at it and put the weight to it, the yeah. The UTV is 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 hindered by the size of the bolts mm-hmm. and size of the hardware that's on the vehicle. Like you, you'll have like a, a one inch diameter bolt on a uh, 
on a 4,400 car, you know, like our bolts are literally like a quarter of an inch. <laughs> and that's what, that's what we need to build is one inch, you know, all suspension bolts are one inch from now on. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that is the standard. But, um, I think <laughs> it, it just, just depends on what the course is. But, but like yeah. I said, when we go back to that, you know, one car to rule them all, the UTV is kind of perfect. It does everything really well. It doesn't do everything great, but it does it really well. And it, uh, it's pretty, pretty crazy. I can't imagine where we're going to be in five years from now, 10 years. Cause it's, uh, it's pretty scary how fast they're going right now. Yeah. I can't imagine. Oh, and we just have, I mean, in Ridgecrest, California, my old car, I went a hundred, 105 miles an hour down the, That's down a the no -go for me. In a, stock, a in a stock car that was MIG welded. The cage was MIG welded with a, oh the cage works cage, you know? <laughs> so it's yeah, like, dude, I, uh, I hit like 65 and I'm like, all right, we're going, we're going pretty quick. <laughs> Probably should tone it down a little bit. And it, it's, uh, you don't realize these machines, you don't realize how fast you're going until you look down at the spill. Yeah. It, it's insane. But I just imagine if you wrecked that versus a trophy truck spec, like, yeah, probably, probably. That would be, or the chances of you surviving if it rolled at that speed yeah. with, with the cage that it had on it and the, just the chassis design, it's not meant to do that. No. And uh, I don't think, yeah, I don't think you could live at a hundred mile rollover in a side by side. Yeah. Yeah, not <laughs> either. Okay, so I got two things I want to bring up. One, and we, and again, I'm trying not to echo what James and I talked about just a couple days ago. Um, but uh, what do you, what do you think about the rumored Pro R that's possibly out there? Um, I just don't see it really happening. Um, the reason I, I would, I say that, or I, I could see a Pro R like a 72 inch Pro. <laughs> Um, I don't see like the big motor that they're talking about putting in it and things like that. Um, just because the price tag, I would see it getting out of hand. I mean, um, it'll be 45 grand, 47 starting, you know, it'll be giant. It'll be well, ginormous. If you think about it, there's always going to be that guy who's like, oh, I got to have the, the, the baddest yeah. machine. But you're the reason they make the, the Turbo S and the reason they make the, the baddest of the baddest machines is so they can sell the 1000. The 1000 is the money maker. It is so cheap. They've made a billion of them. They uh they just pump them out the, the door but and then people go in, the big car drags them in, the big turbo S with the dynamic shocks or the Can-Am RR or whatever. That mm -hmm. drags them in and then boom, they sell the cheaper unit because they're like, I don't want to spend 35 grand. I could spend 18 and get about the same thing and boom, they just made a ton of money. Yeah. So it, I don't see the meat the them needing to make a, a a wicked horsepower like a non belt drive everything like that i i, I see the innovation side of it but mm -hmm. I, uh, as a, a finance thing and making their money back on it i don't think they would make enough money back on it to to justify the cost of building something like that sure. yeah too expensive. Mm -hmm. it would just I, I might be wrong i have no idea i have i don't know the insights but looking at it as a business standpoint, it seems a little out of hand to make a car forty-five grand. And I mean, the new Can-Am four seats, thirty-eight off the off the line. Is it? Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, that's smart, so smart shock four seat. Uh, you know, RR thirty-seven nine. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and that's on the website, so there's no telling what it actually is. Dude, that is outrageous. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, let me ask you this. What are your thoughts on, uh, you know, Polaris basically piecing out on the UTV class with the 1000 CC limitation and just going, hey, well, you know, we had a UTV last year from another competitor that almost, you know, finished, we'll say finished the 4400 class. We're just going to piece out on that. We're going to go 4400 and yeah. make a car that blows the brakes off of it and just has crazy power to weight ratio. Um. I don't, I don't see the like consumer market for that, but I could see maybe them pulling together like a car that uh, it really just depends. All they care about is selling machines. You know, they don't really yeah, agree. They don't really care about um, having the baddest off-road machine. They just want to beat the next guy in line, like, like uh, Can-Am, Kawasaki or everything like that. Yeah. So Maybe if you could get enough support and you could build a car, like say, hey, I want to build this car that, uh, that is a Polaris that is going to race in the 4400, and you could create this concept car and go race it. But I don't see them ever canning the UTV class, like getting out of the UTV class and just yeah. performing against those cars, just because those are just purpose built race cars. You know, like look at Mitch Guthrie in 2019. He took a 
pretty much bone stock Turbo S and one in the King of the Hammers yeah. by a lot, like a ton. Yeah. And it's just, it's insane what that car will do right out of the showroom floor that you, that you and I can go by and we don't need any kind of driving experience. We can go out and go 85 miles an hour in the desert. And it's just insane to me. <laughs> it's yeah, like handing I mean, someone a loaded gun and be like, here you go. <laughs> yeah, that's, and that's how I feel about the Turbo RR. It's got it's got way too much power for its ability. They um, move. They're, they seriously move. I drove one. When was it? Uh, it was a couple weeks ago. Uh, a buddy of mine bought it, and it was it was pretty insane the way the way it drives was it handled was really well. I thought the the power was contained, mm -hmm. like it's not like out of its suspension realm. I think it yeah. can handle that, and um, I think that's where Polaris is, should go next. But where do we cap the horsepower? Where do we say enough's enough? I don't right? know. And rely reliability wise and transmission wise and everything else. Like it, it, it's, I, I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't know where to go, where it's going to go. If we're going to be buying hundred thousand dollar mini trophy trucks here in a little bit or what? I mean, it's coming. I'm sure. I, mean, I hope it's, not because I don't have the money for that. <laughs> <laughs> I got the old trusty 1000 still, man. <laughs> I, uh, Thanks so, Rob, dude. Thanks. Out here in the East Coast, we don't even have the room to open it up. Like I was sitting here, I'm thinking, I haven't even used all the horsepower in my 1000. Like if I, even when I'm really trying to get up something like Slick Rocks or something, I'm still not, you know, pedal to the floor and low and like really just giving it hell. I'm, I'm, you know, being a little conservative. It doesn't need that, so I don't ever really, you know, thrash on it that hard. Even the guys that race, I mean. You know, they're in it pretty good, but there's never a time when we're opened up wide open going 80 miles an hour here, ever. Yeah, I think um, the 1,000 on your guys' side of the 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 globe, yeah. the, the world, <laughs> uh, I call it a, a globe because the terrain is just so different. It's yeah. like you go out there, it's just like night and day from yep. what I ride, basically. Or even if you go from where I live to uh, KOH, like yeah. that, it's just so different. It's like a whole different planet. It's yeah. like I go racing in a jungle over there to racing on the moon at KOH. <laughs> yeah, dude, I love it, man. I, I, so I, at some point I told my wife, we're going to go to Moab next year. I don't know. Yeah. If gonna happen, but we're going to have, we're having a baby in February, but thank you, man. Uh, but we'll see how it goes. I don't know. I would like to do Moab like late oh, summer. Like that. I like to go. I like, I like Moab. I literally live like 60 miles away from Moab. So it's I'll not give you a if we go out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can go wheel. We'll have a good time. Yeah. Um, but I was saying the 1000 is perfect for that scenario because it's not so hard on parts. It doesn't have too much power to break stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a lot easier um, crawling wise. I think they're really good. That's why the rock and trail editions of 1000, if yeah. they needed a turbo, they would put it on a turbo, but they don't need it. Mm -hmm. um, the 1000 is a great platform other than the front diff. That's like my least favorite thing about it. But mine is the reverse chain because yeah. I'm pretty sure mine is like almost broken. Yeah. <laughs> It's like hanging in there. It's like when you put it in reverse, it like makes a couple extra like squeaks and you're like, Ooh, and then you, you know, gotta be really easy getting off of it. But I'll, I'll, I'll either move to a turbo or I'll take that transmission out, put a turbo transmission in and put taller gears in it too. Cause the low for me is it's like, it's almost there. It's just, yeah. yeah, that's, I think that's one of the issues with the turbo S. Like if, if you, if you had said, give me a car uh, or I'll give you a car, any car you want five grand, you, I'll give you five grand to go race it. The mm -hmm. Turbo S would be my machine. But the only problem with the Turbo S is the high gears or the, the gears are so high mm -hmm. that it makes it super difficult to crawl right out of the right out of the stock version of it. Mm -hmm. So I wish they would change the gearing a little bit in it because for every, the everyday guy going into the transmission, you know, that's a freaking task. I won't do it. I'll send yeah. it to somebody. I'm not going to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a lot of money if you're going to send it to somebody. You yeah. know, when I first started racing, I was sending transmissions off to get service, and that was 1200 bucks a pop. And that was just to, that was just for them to break it open and tell me what was wrong with it. Now I can service everything, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm a one-man show in the, in the shop, but I, yeah. you know, I have my friends come in and, and they took stuff to the dealer and they can't figure it out and they bring it to me and we got it figured out in like five minutes. So Dude, that pisses me off more than anything <laughs> else that like the, the dealer support of all these machines is just so crappy. I hate it, man. Not even close to what it should be. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, and maybe it's training, but it's probably just ends up being, you know, crappy employees. But that being said, uh, 
Oh man, I had something else I want to say, but I forgot. But I have something else. All right. Uh, so we talked about uh, Ultra Four having good like visibility. Um, so before I watched you in Area BFE, I got a chance to watch Crandon. They're going back to Crandon. How do you feel about that one? Because to me, that's the like spectator's dream. I sat yeah. on my couch. I had a full two days of racing and like was losing my mind in the 4400. And then when you guys raced, the race was over in like four or five minutes. It felt like I, you know, I just waited and then like, boom, it's over. Yeah. I want to see more of you guys. I want to see y'all going on the big track. Uh, what do you think about Crandon? You're going to be there and how are you going to prepare? Um, I don't even know. Are they going to do the UTVs? Yeah. I don't know. If they, they are going to run them. Oh yeah. Uh, if, if, if they ran us on the big track, I'd potentially go out there. It, it's hard for me to take my, like our cars are so much different. It's hard to take our cars and go compete in a different class, like a short course setting or, mm -hmm. I mean, they do good, but they're not, like I said, you, when you build a car, it has to be great at something. It yeah. has to be really good at short course. It has to be really good in the desert. It has to be, um, our cars are like the 4,400s of the UTVs. They have to be great or good at everything, but not great at any one thing. Mm -hmm. So if, if it's a, if it's not just a short course race and it's like an actual, like there's rocks and stuff in it, then I'd be interested in going, but my car would have no, no, uh, it wouldn't hold a candle to those short course cars. They have, they have like, they have a bunch of carbon fiber in them. There's a ton of, they delete so much stuff. They have smaller fuel tanks. So they only hold like four gallons of fuel because yeah. they don't need a, a, a ton of fuel. So if it was, a, uh, you know, don't get me wrong. I'd love to go race a short course race, but only in a car that would be competitive. Cause I'm not going out there to get second place. Like we hey. don't, like it <laughs> we don't show up and spend all this money and spend all this time to to not do well like I, there's always those guys who want to go out and finish and and finish koh i've never finished king of the hammers um ever so it's but people ask me like why don't you just drive a little slower because i'm not there to finish that race i'm there to win that race i have no intention of getting second i have no intention of getting third first place is the only thing on my mind when i show up to that lake bed so I'll burn the thing down if it gets me to the gets me to the podium. Oh, I love it, dude. That's like brings a little it brings a little like like joy in the heart, a little butterflies yeah. in the belly. That's great. Yeah. So if you if you beat us on a stand up day, uh, you did a good job because <laughs> yeah, uh, it wasn't from lack of effort on my part. I'll tell you that. Okay, so tell me, uh, give me the short the short version of Area BFE. Uh, you're there racing for James Cantrell, um, and then you just do incredible. Tell me about it. Uh, like I said, I wheeled there my whole entire life. I know how the rocks work. My car, when we go test in the rocks, that's usually where we go test. So I know like a combination that was pretty close to what I needed to have. So I ran the 35s uh, EFX tire. It grips super good on that. Uh, on that like slick rock they call it slick rock because the when the wagons would come through there the wagons would slide all over it but on a, on a tire it's not a slick rock it's actually like it's like super grippy so you can get up things that you think you couldn't get up are insane like there were so many ledges there that we that we walked up to or that we drove up to i'm like they want us to go up this this is insane i i don't even think it'll go and the car just crawled right up it wow so uh we pre-ran like crazy and I, I made some changes to the car and it when was, you say make some changes or get a car ready for this particular race. I mean, are you like turning tubes on, 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 you know, your shocks or are you adjusting preload? What are you doing? Uh, I do a lot of preload and spring ad adjusting. Uh, I don't dive into valving too much. Um, just because I, I have a guy who does that for me, mm -hmm. but, um, I don't want to change up some like setting. I, I kind of know how it works and I, and we've got into it before, but, I just don't feel comfortable enough right before a race to just dive into something like that and just tear it up or especially putting uh, shocks back together. If you don't put your shocks back together, they'll blow out seals. And if you don't, <laughs> so I do, a, I have a ton of springs, like even in the trailer, I've got, I've got so many parts, dude. It's insane. I've got a fully dedicated race truck that has all the parts in it all the time. I've got spring setups. I've got a whole different set of shocks. I've got, Literally any part, if you break on that Turbo S, you guys can come to me and I will either give it to you or sell it to you. If you need parts, let me know because I have I have spare transmission. I've got like everything in that truck to make sure that we have the best chances of finishing because you never break. You always break in the pre-running or you break, break something small that you got to change. Like in Oklahoma, we had to change a hub because the hub went bad. A uh, front hub, not the rear hub because those ZRP hubs. Like if you... If you ever have an extra 
thousand bucks to spend on your car, the best thing you can do is put those hubs, dude. They will save. They're insane. But anyways, I'll get back. I'm going off on tangents. No, you're uh, fine, man. Hubs suck. I replace wheel bearings. I in my bouncer, I replace them with wheel bearings every ride, and it ended yep. up being hubs. It's hard lesson learned. I did those ZRP hubs in Moab, and I haven't changed them since. Wow. And I was I used to we used to be changing a hub every other race and wheel bearings every race. I haven't changed the wheel bearing. I haven't changed the hub, and it's gone through. It's that perfect. Might be worth it, honestly. Are they are they a thousand a uh, thousand a corner? I think it's twelve hundred for both. Okay. And they're amazing. If they're, I didn't ever have to worry about it again, you'll never have to worry about it, dude. Yeah, it's pretty. I might, well, yeah, that's one we have talked a lot about. <laughs> but that's just it. Like, if you break it, Travis mm -hmm. is so cool. He'll look at it, he'll change it, but he'll also give you one for free. He'll just awesome. be like, he'll awesome. fix it. So it basically, essentially, it's the last hub you'll ever buy. Yeah. Um, but anyways, we put those on at that race because we had hub issues in the rear, and I told him to bring me. I broke down. I was like, I just got to buy them. I I got to I got to do it. And uh, we put those on, and we pre ran, and we pre ran, and we pre ran. I did like five laps of that course. That was more laps than we did in the race. Just yeah. so I, when I go to the race, it literally we show up, we unload the car, and we take it out and just pre run, pre run, pre run. Because I I don't usually have a co driver. Mm -hmm. I don't like having someone next to me in my ear, like making them. Some people I mean, make sounds, and they do like dude, they. Do I I don't like going riding with anybody. My wife yeah. may hear me in earshot, but if any, if ever anyone who's been trail riding with me, I show up alone because yeah. I don't like having people in there with me. It's so much more fun though. Like yeah, you don't, you don't have to worry. And I, I, I get angry in the car. I get like mean, so yeah. I don't want to tear anybody down or like be rude. Yeah, no, man, I, trust me. If I did something wrong, like uh, in an AO, in that one of the AOP races I did, I got like off course and I was so pissed. Yeah, I ended up like I actually put it in high gear stepped in it and just yep. shot through the woods and like <laughs> put everything on the line to get back on the trail. That was one of those moments where like, if anybody else was in the car, they would have been, you know, like probably giving me a mouthful for putting this in the situation. Yep. And I would have been giving them an earful for good Lord. I'd just be like, yeah. hang on. I, I'd tell them to get out. <laughs> <Walk on. laughs> right. I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so you were pre-running, you pre-ran five laps. You guys got ready. Yeah, we were we were we were perfect, ready to go. Uh, I knew all the lines I was going to take. Everything was good, um, but I was really worried that there was going to be some spots where they like bottleneck and, and things like that. So I actually did end up getting a co-driver, putting him in the car with me, just in case we needed to pull a line, mm -hmm. uh, pull a wedge to get around a weird obstacle. But uh, dude, we had a perfect race. Uh, I, I qualified first. It was I, I had good lines, everything. I, I can't say anywhere where we had an or we had a a cooling issue because my cooling fan quit working in the middle of the race. So we'd get up to the top. You, you basically climb this hill and you mm -hmm. turn around and come down uh, this giant hill or it's kind of a mountain and you, and you come back down. So we'd get to the top of the hill it overheat and I'd limp it, limp it. So we could get rolling downhill again and it would be perfect. Every lap, it was like clockwork. We'd get to the top of that hill, it overheat. And then I'd go down the hill and it would, it would be good again. That's so awesome. yeah, we, that was like picture picture perfect. I can't really uh, see how I could have a better race than that. Sometimes you have those, and sometimes they just they fight you all the way to the end, and you end up not finishing. You break stuff all the <laughs> everything on the car is breaking. But um, I think we've got the car figured out. I've got I've got a system set up, and we finally got a combination that's that's good to win and it's hard to do that like i said a car is only good for about two years maybe three if you're if you're kind to it mm -hmm. um depending on like like in reno i'm sure you've seen the race in reno oh yeah that, that race destroys your car like the oh, rock yeah. i mean listen how could it not when you go from you know 60 70 mile an hour short course into i i had i, I took a really good hard look at it the last yeah. picture i saw floating through my screen and those are not rocks. That's not like a rock garden. That yeah. is boulders with crevices. Yep. It's a, like a you know skid plate grabber, a arm destroyer. It's it's the nastiest thing I've ever seen. I don't even go out and walk them anymore because they just they <laughs> catch me out. Just because yeah. like if I'm not under the visor and behind the steering wheel, I'm like, how are we going to do this? It doesn't even make sense. And yeah. you go out there and you just if you're at speed, it looks it looks doable let me i'll put it out <laughs> yeah i get it i get and, it and if, if we race more of those races next year like i think we're gonna do like sturgis is a short course like mm -hmm. rock racing 
Um, Moab is, is a, is a car killer. There's a lot of rocks where that you, you belly up and roll over. Mm -hmm. Um, if we race more of those, that car chassis will be clapped out next year. I I have a feeling it's not going to be good because it's just the tubing's just, the tubes just get bent in, they get twisted. They're not built for that. So it's, it's, it, it makes it, makes it more difficult to race it a lot because the more you race it, the more you tear it down and you won't have a car coming the future year or you will, it'll be a clapped out car and your front end will fall off. Like we pre ran KOH this year in my, uh, in my 17 car, yeah, my old race car. We pre ran that whole, the whole thing in that car and God bless its heart. It didn't have an issue. I should have raced that car this year. Um, <laughs> But I, I brought it back and I tore off. Actually, I'm gonna, I am I went and bought a Turbo S chassis, mm-hmm. uh, a wrecked one, and I'm putting all the parts from that car into a Turbo S chassis so I can pre-run on a 72-inch car. Because if yeah. you go from 64 to a 72, it's so difficult to drive in the rocks because you think your tires are, are not where they are. Your back, your back passenger tire, it doesn't even – it seems like it's so far away. Like, yeah. You hit it on everything, and you'll get a flat every which way. So if you're constantly driving a 72 inch car, it's better off. But um, the whole front chassis of that car, all the welds were broken. It literally is is if I took a grinder to two little spots, it would come right off the whole front. Ooh. Yeah, that's where the shocks hold everything on. So hey, I was like, don't need those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the whole the shocks just would have went right through the hood. <laughs> oh gosh, that's so. Uh, like I said. Yeah, it really just depends uh, how many races we do. I get to keep if I how long I get to race this car, and that mm-hmm. goes back to building a car. That uh, if you every time you build a car, there's going to be new car blues. So mm-hmm. it, these guys who like go to KOH and they build a new car every year blow my mind how that they how they can stay um, competitive without finding an issue in the race because it's mm-hmm. so difficult to push a car in practice the way you would in a race situation because you just you get in a different mindset. you know, like, everything's different. I've never been able to push a car in practice the way I have in a race because I'm just, uh, not, you're not in that space to let everything go. Like you'll lose, you'll, you'll do whatever you can to win a race, but yeah. in practice you'll back off like, Oh, the belt temp's a little higher. So this is, this is going on or it's making a noise in a race. If it's making a noise, you keep going and yeah. until that thing stops, you, uh, you're, uh, you're still, throttled down like you said 70 miles an hour into the rock garden <laughs> takes a it takes a special kind of person to be able to do that i think even if i knew like hey unlimited budget unlimited whatever whatever you need i would hit that rock garden and i'd get right up on it and be like oh, no, no, hang on <laughs> you know so yeah. i I, uh, I can only imagine i'll say it like that um but that's super exciting so i want to mention one thing about the crossbar race was there was this optional line in uh, loop b and it was, you know, you're going through this little creek water crossing. What was the obstacle call? Was it like Hell's Stairway or something like this? Hell's Gate, I believe okay. that's what they call it. Which is a, which is a, um, it's a trail in Moab, which I thought was funny. Yeah. But they took it from there and called it Hell's Gate. I, I, it would just seem weird to me calling uh, another trail uh, the same name. It'd be like calling it yeah. Backdoor or something like that. Like. Yeah, we have, uh, we have a lot of those in the East Coast where the way it works here in racing, if they cut a new hill and they race it, whoever climbs it first gets to name it. So there's oh, okay. like a million Showtime hills where Timmy climbs something in the Showtime buggy, yeah. or like Anthony names every hill No Respect Hill or No you know No Respect or something. That's like cool. That. I can, I can understand that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's cool because you leave a little legacy. But yeah, yeah, we have some like like you know, there's only one boat ramp. You know, yeah. and that's that's in the southeast. And if there was another boat ramp, you'd kind of be like, ah, man, this is a boat ramp. You know, so, that's a good that's a good name for a climb. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, if you go if you go online, I encourage anybody who hadn't seen it before, just type in uh, like Mad Ram boat ramp, and uh, it's this like granite little slick waterfall with like a constant little dribble down it, and gotcha. uh, dude, you got to hit it wide open unless you have a nice set of stickies. But there you go. Some days you can climb it. Some days, you know, the same pair of stickies with the same conditions just don't work as well. You never um, know. So uh, you took Hell's Gate, right? Yeah, I took it all three laps. Uh, my dad and I went out after qualifying because I wanted to see the Loop B one more time. Yeah. And uh, we went out and I, I came up to it and, I, and every, it seemed like everybody was scared to hit it. Like I talked to 
like Cade, he don't, he would, I wouldn't say he's scared to hit it, but he's just like, it's just gonna be hard on my car and all that. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was looking at, it, I was like, my car fit perfect in the line, like yeah. it was perfect. My dad was like, if you think you can do it, do it. So he walks up there, and uh, I put on my put on my belts, and we hit it, and it didn't walk right up it by any means. Like I had to back up and do it a couple times, but I hit it, and we did it, and I was like. Shh. That could be kind of sketchy during the race. Like, what if I don't get it the first time yeah. and I got back up or or you get up on it and it turns you sideways or you roll yeah. up on the hill? And in the race, I was uh Jamie had pitted in lap one. I, I called like I said, I qualified seventh. I didn't see anyone the whole first lap. And I ran my first my first loop, my loop A or whatever, mm-hmm. way too conservative. Cause I was scared because I popped like three tires in pre-running. Mm-hmm. And that was just pre-running phase. So I was running way too conservative. I thought there'd be more attrition in this race and everyone's car really held together. I was surprised. That's, like That's the same comment I made to James last week. I was like, holy crap, dude, we have people finishing races now. It's crazy. Yeah. And um, so the whole first loop, I didn't pass anybody. I was like, man, this is going to be a tough race. Cause I yeah. saw that no one with no one had died yet. And uh, we come into the pit. A couple guys were out at the pit. Jamie had just pulled in. My dad told me Jamie pulled in Wolf was running and, uh, I, I came around and we went out to loop B and Jamie caught back up to me because I still wasn't pushing hard in the rocks. Mm-hmm. And uh, we got right down in that creek bed and Jamie passed me. I let him by me and we were going through the going through the creek and he slowed way down. I was like, Is he break something. What's going on here? And he's just going slow. Yeah. And I don't know if he doesn't like the water or what's going on, <laughs> but he was because he's fast, like in the, in the normal stuff, he's ripping. He got in the water and was just got, got a little shook or something. But uh, I couldn't get around him, and he went on the left line, and I was like, well, here it is. Let's do it. Yeah, <laughs> and buddy. The car, right when I got up it, it was just spinning because you come out. The problem is it would be an easy climb, but you come out of the water. So mm-hmm. your, your tires are covered in water. So when you get up to the climb, you just spin. So uh, I hit it, got up. It picked my tires up just like my worst fear, rolled it up on the wall. So I almost rolled over, back down, hit it again, and one shot at it. Or two shot at it. Yeah, it just ripped right up it. And uh passed uh past Jamie and it put serious time on him. Like he didn't yeah. he didn't catch back up to me until lap A, about halfway through lap A, because I was just babying my tires just because I was yeah. scared. Like I just, just didn't want to get a flat. That was the biggest thing. We didn't want to get a flat. Cause I knew that would uh, take some serious time and um, the whole race, literally the whole race power steering was intermittent. It was turning off. It was turning on. It was doing some crazy, but my gauges were turning off and then turning back on. And then uh, right in the lineup before the race, my uh, battery light came on and I was checking my voltage. It was at 15 volts. So it was oh. over, it was overcharging my batteries which, which I don't know if you know this, it'll blow your batteries up. They'll supercharge themselves and get too full and explode, basically. Oh, my God. No, <laughs> yeah. I had no idea. I'm, I'm yeah. terrified. Or it'll make them fail, you know? Yeah. That's why they have your, like in most racing organizations, they want you to have them fully enclosed because if they do overcharge themselves, they'll puff up on the sidewalls and they can blow out and battery mm-hmm. acid can get everywhere. Mm-hmm. So I was in there in the lineup, like we're already having problems right here. Yeah. <laughs> And so I just, I ran it and I didn't have any, the gauges kept turning off, but the car was running fine. Mm -hmm. So I just kept pushing and pushing, but the power steering just kept turning off and on. So I'd turn the car off, turn it back on. It worked for like 10 seconds and then turn off and I turn it off and turn it back on. So other than that, we, we ran a pretty perfect race, but my hands were so beat up. I could bear, and it was so cold because the water would hit your hands Mm -hmm. and and then the wind's blowing because you're driving fast. So your hands are popsicled and I had no power steering. So I'm trying to hold on with these cold hands, Ew. trying to hold on to the, I, whenever we got out of the car, I couldn't even like, my hands were like, I, yeah. I thought I had cerebral palsy or something. <laughs> I was just locked up and yeah. you know, I was, I was really happy for the circumstance. I was, I was really upset that we got second because I know that we were super capable to win that race. Yeah. But just the, just for the circumstances that happened, like Nathan ran a perfect race and that's what happened to the King of the Hammers. Like he, he didn't have a single issue. Um, he didn't have a pro. I mean, he might've had a pro. I didn't really talk to him, 
he seemed kind of standoffish to me. So, <laughs> but I, uh, maybe it's because I, I beat him last year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I can't speak for your personal relationship. Every time yeah. I've been with him, you kind of break the ice a little bit, and then yeah. there's some of the you know, just like everyone else in the league, they're they're absolutely great people. Um, but yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure as a competitor, post race or pre race. Yeah. People are people are and it's nice to people that are fast, you know. Like sure. if, you're, if you're if you're not winning, then everyone will help you out. Everyone's there to do whatever they can to help you. But if yeah. you're winning, that changes things. No one's gonna. T- t- they're not gonna give you their secrets. They're not gonna. They're not gonna uh, tell you what's going on. Like at my pit, I'm an open book. If mm-hmm. if you need help, come on over. I'll do whatever I can to help you out. It doesn't matter. Uh, you need tools. You need parts. Anything like that. Like if you don't have any money to, or like a lot of guys have freaking stacks of cash they bring over when they need parts, but because everyone's rich, it seems like <laughs> the races. Okay, so so look, that, let, let's talk about that for a second because that's something that I got into this sport in like. Did, I, I was just like, man, everyone who races is loaded, and there are people who race that are super loaded. Mostly, everyone in the forty four hundred class seems to have an unlimited budget. That's that's its own thing, but. I have found out that, and maybe it's just the guys I've interviewed, a lot of these guys, like, this is what they do, you know? Yeah. Like, this is it. This, or There is no, you know, there is no family vacation. There is no trips to this and that. There is no, like, you know, yeah, yeah. on the side. This is what you do. And I, I think that that makes it more relatable to everyone else, you know, just a hobbyist, because a lot of times the hobbyist, this is what they do. They dump, you know, any extra money they have, they'll fix those wheel bearings, or they'll yeah. you know, go get some A-arms. And, and the guys who race are that just to a bigger degree and they just siphon a, you know, a substantial amount more. Yeah. I think, I mean, I've seen some guys come up to me with pockets full of money, so, <laughs> but we carry all our parts. So I'm like, how do you yeah. have all this money and don't have all your parts with you? Like this kind of blows my mind. But, um, but like I said, carrying, uh, carrying parts and stuff like that. Like if anyone needs help, I'm definitely there to help them. It yeah. seems like everyone's going to Can-Ams now. So hey. I'll be, only razor guy with all my parts. <laughs> I better hey, all the parts you need, man. You got yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I I uh, I won't be able to rely on anyone else from now on. So yeah. Well, all in all, we'll see how that turns out. But congratulations on the second place finish. I know that it, you you know obviously you wanted to be first, but second place at that race and highlight reel for the forty nine hundred class. You made it. They got you going up Hell's Gate, and it is it is dude. It's vicious looking. It is it's- absolutely awesome. The video does no justice to what that. Oh, looks. absolutely not. Like no. when you look, when you look at it, it almost looks undoable. Like even even in the big, like I think the UTV was the best car for that because it's mm-hmm. super thin and it's like a little valley. It's yeah. got like it's like a V. Mm-hmm. And when I saw the big cars do it, I was like, Jesus, that is! I can't imagine being that wide and putting my tire up on it and yeah. going up sideways. Well, like you have the video of Blyler coming through it, and he just yeah. hits it, and, he, and the cr- like. He, he did it perfect. He, well, he he stalls for a second, and you're yeah. just like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's the worst thing that can happen is you can yeah. stall halfway, and then all of a sudden you just like – it's like the little like goat that could. It just keeps picking itself up. And I see – you know, I watched a video of you guys the day after, and yeah. you got – I mean, you just like a, a fist coming through there. I thought it was awesome. Yeah, you got to keep momentum. Like like you said, if you, you back off – and that's what people don't get about rock crawling. Like they yeah. think – I think you can just like slowly just creep up it and or their tires are just so awesome that they can just crawl up it. Like you have to have momentum. You're going to be banging stuff up. That's why your clutch doesn't work. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, well, man, congratulations. Uh, what is next for you? You're building the Turbo S. You said, you know, you got a new frame or you salvage that's, frame. That's just going to be a, uh, a pre-run car. It's not going to be, a, it's not going to be a race car. I'm going to stick with this car. Um, I'm not going to really, uh, uh, it's just gonna be a fun play car. I, I've never had a car r- recently where I can just take out with my buddies and yeah. go have a good time and enjoy that lifestyle because that's what got me into it. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm gonna make this car into that, and uh, I'm gonna. It, it's got to be a good pre-run car too. It's gonna be basically my race car mm-hmm. uh, because I'm gonna pre-run all the race courses in it. I, I have a tendency of lo- I love to go pre-run. I love to be out on the racetrack as much as possible. And you get good film there. You can post it up and stuff like that. You know, you, uh, Vaughn Gettin used to race with us at Jimmy's 4 by 4 And he said something to me. He's like, you can't guarantee where the race is going to go. You, you don't know if it's if you're going to win or lose or in between. But you can, you can uh, make sure you generate the content that you need for that race. 
So like when you're going out pre-running, put, put the GoPros on there, you know, make, you make it look like you're racing. That's a good idea. I like it. It doesn't matter. Even if you went five miles, if, if, as long as you have it in pre-running, then you can show like, Oh, I didn't make it, but you don't have to tell them you didn't make it. You can just yeah. say, Hey, I, this is, uh, this is all the cool video and all that. So. Yeah. Cause all you really need is you need, you know, it's like, uh, there's an episode of the office where Jim goes to, uh, Robert yeah. California, the CEO's house. And he says, you know, I'm a master of leaving a party early. What he does is he goes, he sees something impressionable, impressionable from the night, takes a picture and then leaves. It's one of those things like if you go, you pull up on Hell's Gate and you get the GoPro footage, you know, you're coming up it. Yep. And then, you know, hey, I was there. You guys, you know, like, oh, you see, this was in the race course, you know, a yep. little bit of easy association there. I like that. That's a good that's a really good strategy. Yeah. And like I said, you don't in the race. Who knows what could happen? It's true. So you need to make sure that you can you can capture that stuff before before the race and make sure you have some some content and some stuff to give back to the people who give to you. Dude, that's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Uh, is there anything that we did not cover? Are you um, going to be at Amherst 21? Oh, absolutely. That's amazing. I'll be there the rest of the, as, as, as long as I can financially make it and I can uh, <laughs> I can <laughs> physically make it. I'll probably be there the rest of my life. I don't see okay. uh, as long as I'm competitive. I, yeah. I, I I don't like to do anything if I'm not competitive in it. If I'm not if I'm not able to run up front, the only thing I can uh, I can say is I, I don't I don't want to like get into politics or anything, but I don't know how long I'll be in a Polaris any if uh, I can't get some more help. I don't mean to sound like a crybaby. I don't want this to get to somebody and uh, at Polaris and be like, oh, he's crying about not being a driver or anything. I just I just I, I feel like I'm I, I'm not going to be loyal anymore to something that's not loyal to me. So. Yeah, I understand. Well, in the reason, let me back that up a little bit here. And the reason you can make that claim is because you're successful at what you do. You know, it would be, I to, yeah. It, well, I mean, it'd be different if you're getting 30th at every race and you had, you know, you had 16 followers on Instagram and Facebook, it yeah. probably, you know, you probably don't have the credibility to kind of make that kind of statement. However, it's not that way. You're yeah. in constant contention for the, you know, championships. You're a great representative of the sport. So I, I agree with you. Um, not just you. I think that, you know, I will call it what it is. I think Polaris needs to step up and support the race team. Um, Absolutely. And, so, and not even just me. I think it's time. Yeah. Uh, and you can see the progression of the other the other manufacturers. Kawasaki is have been at every Ultra 4 event demoing vehicles. They they have, do. Kawasaki's been doing awesome. They're the, they ran hammers with yeah. 35s this year on a yeah. brand new release machine, and it lived. On a guy that doesn't drive off-road. You know, oh, Jeremy, yeah. Yeah, he's a great driver, but he's not, he's not the caliber. It's just like Donald Cerrone showing up at the UTV world championship. He was expecting that he was going to just kill it. It's like us going to the cage and saying, Hey, Donald, yeah. we're going to come and we're going to come and beat you up just because we're good at right, driving UTVs. Like you can't come into our world. And this is what we do every day. Our whole yeah. entire lives are our family's lives are evolved around it. And you think you're going to come and lay it down on us. Yeah. Not going to happen. <laughs> so <laughs> but, while, we're, while we're on that subject, uh, what do you think about Habib? Twenty nine and zero, he retires. Do you think he'll be back for thirty? Um, that's a good question. I I really respect that guy's like his word, and I think mm -hmm. he needs it because he said he wasn't going. To, he said he wasn't going to come back. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny you're such an MMA fan. My dad's actually a crazy jujitsu guy. Like he, oh, he's got a brown belt. He's been training for like I think fifteen years. Dude, that's he, amazing. He's like aged twice. Uh, he's. Two and zero oh there. He's my uh, he's my enforcer. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. That's yeah, awesome. He's, he's a he's a he's he's a beast, man. He's he's getting. I think he's gonna be fifty this year. So we'll wow. see if we can take the old man now. I don't know if I can, but <laughs> yeah, no, I I think it's awesome. And and I'll be honest with you. So I'm like you. Uh, I'm first generation racer, if you want to call me that. I just I sit in this nice office chair and I talk about racing. Uh, but no one in my family does cars. No one in my family does really anything like that. Um, but no one in my family does combat sports or anything like that either. Yeah. My family didn't play sports. They are music people. So I did the music stuff when I was younger and now I'm into all this other stuff. Um, dude, there's so, there's so much, so many different things to enjoy out there. But the fact that uh, your dad's 50 brown belt still going at it. Awesome, dude. Yeah. I've been trying to get uh, my wife into it. Obviously she's pregnant. So it's not the best time in the world to get started in jujitsu. But after that, we'll have a, you know, I, I have mats here at my house, like, 
I was, I told my wife this morning, we're looking, you know, at moving in a couple of years and buying land so I can build a shop and uh, nice. I can build a, a rightful studio, uh, you rather than what you can't see. And in some of the episodes, you can see it. This is uh, probably 13 feet wide, 15 feet wide. And it is a small office. And, uh, and, and oh, I, got, I got something cool. I want to show you too. Actually, I'm going to send you um, something I'm gonna really cool. off real quick. Cause no, you're good. You're good. I'm going to, I'm going to send you this. Uh, don't don't say what it is yet, but uh, okay. we'll talk about it in a second. Um, but yeah, man, uh, I'm going to build uh, like a little dojo in my next shop. I'd like to have like a, at least like a, a you know fifteen by fifteen, yeah, or, or something bigger. You know, something with like a, a decent amount of square footage, and I'd get it matted and you know put some mats on the walls and stuff, and that way me and my buddies could really uh, throw each other around. But. Uh, or while Cole plugged his uh, laptop in, he's doing a little bit of his camera's doing a little bit of spinning. Can you still hear me? Okay, Cole cannot still hear me. Uh, so I, whenever Cole gets back in here, I sent Cole a picture of something that is coming in the mail for me. Um, I had a really really cool opportunity with uh, one of the race leagues to uh, talk to them and get some more information from them. So all that being said, I sent. Uh, they're sending me some stuff and I'm going to be able to share that with you guys really soon. Um, it's going to go in the studio and it is some of the coolest stuff. Let me, uh, let me see here if he's here. Cole, can you hear me at all? All right. I think that's it. I think I lost Cole. So we'll give him a couple seconds here. Um, everybody, something I'm going to start here while we wait on Cole, I'm going to announce this here. So I'm going to start uh, what's called uh, roast my setup. And I personally have seen like other like streamers, podcast people do this. And I think it's really, really funny, uh, especially when it's done well. I am not like the funniest person in the entire world. Oh, I hear Cole coming back in. Um, Thank you. guys. I, I don't have video on you, but I can I can hear you. Um, but I, Cole, I was telling him something I'm going to start doing actually on the Facebook and the Instagram uh, I'll probably go up to the YouTube because it'll be a video is uh, I'm going to start doing called rate my or roast my setup. And it could be anything. It could be where you work every day, like my office. It yeah. could be, I'm going to do, I'm going to post a picture of my office, my podcast studio and my garage. And what I want everyone to do is I want them to roast my setup, so <laughs> roast my garage, roast my office, all of it, because my office and my podcast studio are one and the same, but yeah. Uh, what I want to do is I want to start having everybody submit their stuff. And we, as a collective or myself, we're going to start doing a little roast session of the garages. And, and what it'll do is it'll kind of get people in who who maybe aren't um, aren't able to have a full podcast episode about them. But, you know, say, for example, they want to send me a picture of their, their vehicle and their garage and their setup. Yep. We'll come in and we'll talk about it. We'll make a video of it. And I think I'm going to start doing that with my podcast guests. So it would be a little something fun for people to get in here and do. Nice. Um, but that's something new. Did you get that picture I sent you by chance? Um, let me see. I was on my. I just texted you. Was it? I don't know if I don't have. I don't really have that great a service in my house right here where I'm at. That's okay. It doesn't. It doesn't look like it's sent through. Um, but I'll send it to you after off the air. Uh, yeah. I was telling them that one of the uh, one of the race promotions around here, they're sending me some stuff to put in the studio, and it is like some of the coolest stuff that I could have had. But yeah, that's um, awesome. Yeah, you've grown the show. You've done a good job. And, What'd you say? I'm sorry, I missed well, uh, it. Uh, you've grown the show. You've done. You guys are doing a good job. I uh, I like the the people you bring on. It's good to hear. It's good to hear the voices of, from the, the other people. You don't really you don't see them. All you do is you get to you get to see them at the racetrack, but you don't really know their stories. And it's, it's pretty cool to 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 see the backstory and see uh, have it come full circle to see who those people actually are. Yeah, man. And I'll tell you this. So my biggest following is in the southeast, but I'm starting to pick up more West Coast guys uh, because you know there's this disconnect and I like bridging the gap and getting people. So, you know, now when they watch an ultra four race and they see Cole Clark on, you know, they, when they watch King of Hammers and they see your name in the list of drivers as time is moving up, they'll be like, Oh, I know that dude. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they'll like have some kind of association with you. Cause uh, not only is it good for me, cause I really love talking to you guys, but yeah. uh, I like it when you guys, you know, are scrolling through Facebook and you see a Mad Ram 11 video of some dude, you know, shooting his bouncer to the moon. You're like, oh, I know that guy. That guy really likes playing volleyball when he's not doing this. And yeah. <laughs> you have these like faux friendships with people and you know more about them. I, I really like that. I think that that's cool. 
Yeah, and it's it's cool to shed light just on that uh, the rock bouncing stuff. Like it's cool because Ultra Forest brought me into that kind of realm. Like I've actually got to see that. Like I never would have gone to the East Coast to go watch one of those events. Uh, mm -hmm. I think two years ago they had one in uh, I think was it uh, Kentucky. They had yeah. a the SRS or whatever a Southern Rock mm -hmm. Racing deal there, and uh, it was insane. Like the big tires and the huge horsepower and just the sound that those things make in those canyons yeah. is pretty gnarly. And you get to actually get to watch it. Yeah, so it, it, is, a, it is cool. And, and one of the discussions I had with the host of their live show was, you know, it's almost like Monster Jam-esque. And I don't absolutely. know if people get mad, like the drivers get mad when I say that. I don't mean that to downplay it. I mean, like, you have to understand that this is a pure spectacle, what you're doing. Yeah. It is amazing. The sound, you know, it's it's the whole immersive experience of what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing. And, you know, when I watch you literally shoot a 25 foot cliff and then fly off of it and, you know, whatever it may be, it's amazing. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. And it's a completely different feel than when you get when you watch an ultra four race. Uh, you know, I watch King of Hammers. I'm like biting my nails by the end of the day because I'm like, ooh, correct the time. I'm waiting for yeah. the time to come in. Like, who's actually going to win? Yeah. Uh, there are two different experiences, but I'm, I'm glad that we're, I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the points where they get to get married together and everybody yeah. can learn about everybody else. So I like it. I think Ricky, uh, Ricky Berry from RC, mm -hmm. RCV said it best. It's like Ultra Four is more about the results and the the rock bouncing is just pure entertainment. It's like so. I mean, we care about who wins and who got up the hill the fastest, but it's almost like you care more about the carnage or like I, I think yeah. someone did like a a backflip pirouette, yeah, and they landed on their wheels and they went down to the bottom and did it again. And like, oh, yeah, yeah. So that's it's funny. The craziest part of that is that the guy who owns that buggy, he had ended up hurt his, hurting his back earlier in the season. Oh, really? And he just put his son in there and said, and his son, he was like, Hey, you know, I need, I need points to show up. And I also, you know, like, it'll give you a chance to go race and do it. And his son goes out and like, makes a highlight reel for a lifetime, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's like the most notable thing I see when I, when I think of rock bouncing, that's what I think. Of. Yeah, dude. Well, I, it's, it's, it used to be, in the old days, like that's what you watched for. And now it's so it's evolving into this thing where, yeah. you know, we really are starting to care about results and it's different because there's, I don't want to say luck, but there's like, there's, there's so many different factors into it that, you know, it's such a condensed event, but there's so many factors that this one guy who's probably the better driver just gets, you know, is off by six inches and, and it yeah. runs, ruins his whole run. Uh, it's a it's a real quick thrill, and it's I think a, again it's where I started in my fandom and stuff like that. So it's great. Yeah, I, I love watching it. Uh, and if you go out to Reno for the Nationals race, mm -hmm. that reminds me similar of that, like going through that rock garden and seeing all those forty four hundreds pile down that rock garden, and right. you know you care about first place because first place is usually way out there. But it's the guys in the middle of the pack who are fighting and racing and and yeah. blowing their tires, and they and you're literally like 30 feet from the rock pile and the guy jumps it and blows his tire and you hear like a huge boosh, yeah. tire tires going everywhere. And it's like, that's where people come to see. They don't, we love seeing the guy who's in first. It's cool and all, but you want to see the show. And that's what, that's what really makes it um, fan friendly there. Like that's my favorite race of the year. KOH is probably my least favorite race of the year. And Reno is the best. Uh, if you can ever get a chance to go out there, it's, fan friendly it's you get to meet the drivers you get to go out and you yeah. get to see the whole thing it's all on a hill yeah. and you can't miss it like that's the only race my uh my girlfriend likes to go to because she can actually Ooh. watch it <laughs> you know we go to these races you see us take off you see us come through the pits and then you see us at the end just dirty yeah. and you don't really get to see what's going on out out in reno it's the best place to go i would highly if you uh if you ever wanted it's a it's super family friendly they have giveaways they have like all kinds of vendors and it's i see it growing that race specifically growing exponentially you can see ultra four making that shift into these races that you can actually see the course more and that there's yeah. giant rock gardens and stuff and if that's where we're going to shift to the cars are going to shift they're going to stay wide they're going to be low and they're going to be ready to rock crawl or go over those rock gardens as fast as possible. Cause that's where the entertainment's at. It seems like. Yeah, like there's something to it. Something to it but, sure. uh, yeah, I, I really respect those, uh, rock bouncer guys. And I think those guys are next level seeing some of those Hills. Like I love doing that. I mean, whenever I go out East, it, it, it's so much fun. Cause I like, I like that style of climbing. Cause it reminds me of uh, snowmobiling. 
you know, yeah. finding these huge hills and finding the line and making sure you can make it up. And when you don't make it up, there's serious consequence sometimes. <laughs> That's a fact. That's absolute fact. All right, dude. We're almost at two hours, so let's let's close this bad boy out. Uh, yep. I know I'm taking up way more of your Halloween than I had expected to, but I enjoyed talking to you. Um, anybody that you need to say uh, goodbye, thank you, anything like that, too? Yeah, I've picked up uh, RCV this year, and they're, they've been like a serious game changer. Um, I used to run. I was never sponsored by Super ATV, and I think Super ATV makes a good product. Mm -hmm. But RCV, for a racing standpoint, is just next level. They're, U, uh, they're made in the USA. Um, you can call somebody and get actual like really good representation rather than someone on the phone from a different company who doesn't really know about the product. Like when you call those guys, they know everything about their product. They can tell you how to fix it and, and they have a great warranty. So RCV has been a, a, a huge thing. I was breaking axles all year and this last race we switched to RCV and I have one issue and I was spinning tires. Like this isn't, this isn't me just like, Oh, I'm partnered with RCV. This is yeah. me telling you like, this is a quality product. I, I've never, had something that was as reliable. Um, ZRP helps me out a lot. Zebros is probably my biggest partnership. They've uh, they're they're now owned by Wheel Pros, so everything that comes along with real Wheel Pros, uh, like uh, KMC wheels, EFX tires, um, they make. We, we're working towards making really great suspension. You know, it, in the years past, it wasn't always as a. Uh, is rigid and, and durable. Like I've raced on the same set of A arms all year long, and uh, they've been. They've been amazing before we would have to change a arms all the time and making sure that everything's good but we uh we, like i said we've been on the same set of a arms um i got to think rugged radios we've got our our stuff figured out there um who else a factory utv this is my skid plate i always leave them last and i have no idea why but yeah. uh, <laughs> they make the best skid, like the skid plate is probably the most important thing on the car because yeah especially for what we do and even what uh rock bouncing stuff like that like i can't imagine if uh you didn't have a good skid plate you would destroy the bottom of that car and oh, if, yeah. if it's not able to slide like i've seen people make metal skid plates and they don't let them slide it just catches oh. the metal and just yeah. just tears everything up so factory utv makes a, a, a super quality product i know there uh there's some different stuff out there if, if, if you need a skid plate i'll go to factory utv but get a skid plate on your car. I tell this to everyone. I have friends yeah. that bring in their stuff. I don't care which one you get. Just make sure you get one because you're going to tear up your 30,000. I mean, you said that Can-Am's $38,000. How fast can you tear it up without a skid plate on that thing? Dude, like, you can do it in one hit. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely insane. Um, let's see. I'm probably forgetting. Uh, PRP Seats does all my uh, harnesses, window nets, and stuff like that. Um, I just, I gotta, gotta say these people just cause they, they, they do so much for me. And, uh, um, I, Jimmy's four by four, like they got me into racing. They're always there. Randy has a wealth of knowledge that is just beyond me. Like I'll, he's, he's been racing his entire or not, not even just racing, but building race cars his whole life. And, it, uh, they, they, they let me come in, use the shop, do whatever. And, and they see that I'm serious now. I, I remember at the beginning of the show, I said, uh, they just thought I was some fly by night guy. And I yeah. didn't really get a lot of respect. And now when I go in there, you know, they treat me like a full on race car driver. So I can't thank those guys enough. Cool. And uh, I'm excited to, I, I know I said, I don't like King of the Hammers, but it's just because I know how hard I have to work and uh, we're going to put it in when hopefully we can get the results back. Uh, as long as we have a car that's going, uh, that's going to be able to stay together, which I think we have now, mm -hmm. we're going to be a serious contender and I can't really see anyone beating us as long as we have a clean day. Yeah. Well, dude, that's awesome. I'm happy for you. As always, I know we'll get the, the best result possible from you. You leave nothing on the table. Class. <laughs> it, maybe. That's it. All right. Cool, man. We're going to turn this off here. Stay on the line with me. And uh, everybody, thanks for listening.